All right, guys. Well, um, thanks for being here. And uh, I'm just going to like give it a little, a few minutes uh, to let some people get in that are wanting to get in that haven't, uh, you know, clicked the link yet or gotten onto YouTube. Uh, and then also, I'm hopefully going to uh, wait to hear from all of you that are watching to tell me that my audio and video is not lagged and that uh, it's working okay. Because last time we had a little bit of issues and this time I'm in Rochester, New York in a hotel uh, with a mobile setup on a laptop and hotel Wi-Fi that is the, uh, the second uh, iteration of the hotel <laughs> Wi-Fi. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, I had a hotel uh, schedule that I specifically picked out because I talked to the manager and uh, <laughs> wanted to make sure and verify that they had Wi-Fi that was capable of being able to run a YouTube stream and it was not. So that was great, uh, but now we got a new one. And uh, so <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I hope it works. Uh, so how, how are all of you doing? Let me see if uh, the chat's starting to get going just a little bit. Um, let's see if I can get out of here. All right, cool. Let's see what we got. Hmm. Actually. Well. Let me fix this a uh, little on the fly uh, editing here. My chat box being on a new computer is not the right size. Man, you know what? You can just never have things go right. I think that's good. Cool. Awesome. So I guess we do have uh, synced up Wi-Fi and uh, audio video. That's good. Um, okay, cool. So uh, I guess what I was going to do is um, because that this episode right now is supposed to be kind of like a YouTube live hangout version. Um, and, and a little bit informal. I'll just start it off maybe about 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes of answering some questions from you guys if you had any, uh, if you had a chance to listen to more of the podcast episode that was released last week. Um, I can go over any of that. If you have any questions that are completely unrelated to that, we can go through that. Um, and then I'll just go through a little bit uh, of stuff with you guys while we wait for more people to come in. Then I'll kind of get into the topic uh, for this episode. Uh, I will preface uh, the episode, um, the like formal educational uh, aspect of this episode with the fact that um, it's going to be like somewhat vague uh, because the homework after this episode is going to be for you guys to go and try to do um, what we're going to talk about. And I don't want to give too much information away because I want you guys to try to like cognitively think through all of it um, and have a little bit of um, experiential and exploratory practice uh, and um, kind of like indulge yourself in trying to figure out what we're talking about here because that's really the best way that we learn. Um, the purpose of this episode is going to be talking about uh, basically um, how do you go through and put together a practice plan like even more simply the purpose of this episode is going to be uh, how do you plan like, like literally how do you practice um, it's an interesting question because I get I get that question so often in lessons you know like oh well I was oh there's my dog in the background <laughs> I got the we got a little we got a little guest for the next couple hours but anyways 
Um, I get that question so often in lessons, which is like, you know, oh, I'd really like to just talk to you about how I can how I can practice, how I can make use, uh, the best use of my time to be able to, you know, put together something and plan something uh, for me to go out and do so I can make progress quickly out on the course and not kind of like just waste ammo on shooting. So um, I kind of would like to answer that question, um, but not necessarily in a way by giving you an answer, but instead giving you something so that you can always find the answer to that question. So that's kind of my goal for today. Um, the uh, And I think it should be good. Um, so basically the format of, the, of this episode and the next one. <laughs> Bella, what are you doing, huh? You having fun? Oh my gosh. But the goal of this episode and the next episode will essentially be to be a, a, a paired uh, series of releases where this one is going to give you the tools to kind of halfway figure it out yourself and then hopefully within the next week seven days uh, you'll be able to uh, go out and actually practice and then be able to come back and we'll actually talk about it discuss it um, and uh, on the YouTube live episode for um, the formal episode, so it'd be like not this coming week, but the week afterwards, I'm actually going to plan on uh, having some of you guys on as guests for the episode, um, like live guests where we where I talk to you, interview you, um, get some feedback of what your experience was, uh, and um, and like kind of guide you through a little bit more of what we were talking about to help you better understand what we're doing. I want to do that in two episodes. That way it gives you guys time to be able to find time to practice. Not everybody's going to be able to go out and put together a plan, organize something, analyze tournaments to to, uh, to build a plan. I just accidentally gave a little bit of the information away in that uh, response there. Uh, and then and then be able to go actually uh, go out and actually execute it and, and then come back and, and discuss it and unpack it live on an episode in less than a week so I want to give you guys two weeks for that uh, and uh, for those of you that do have time to be able to do that in one week then what will happen is that the recorded episode that will be released next week will be a really great in-depth version of everything that we talked about here so you can try it on your own do it this weekend wait for the recorded episode to come out and then uh, refocus everything so that would be awesome um, the uh, uh, a subtle observation that I'm a little bit curious about is why I have a insanely overbuilt computer at home in a multi-display office with a bunch of like professional recording equipment and I get terrible lag in my video uh, and audio with literally um, fiber internet but I'm over here in a hotel on a laptop uh, strung together last minute and it seems to be working perfectly so that really makes me feel good about my financial investment <laughs> holy cow oh my gosh yes Bella is the star of the podcast um, she's an awesome dog she is an English Cocker Spaniel right hey Bella say hello Are you can teach anybody how to practice maybe how to practice retrieving birds <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, cool. Very cool. Well, uh, so I will say that um, some of you may have uh, noticed on the top of the, well, where is it? On the top right here of the screen, it has a link for the shoot analysis sheet. I really apologize. I sound like I'm having a lisp when I talk, but my mouth is so dry and I don't have any water or anything. Um, but you may notice that I, there's a link for the shoot analysis sheet on the top of the, of the uh, video and that the poll in here has is asking you in the chat if you have done a shoot analysis sheet yet. The purpose for that is because that is what we're going to pull heavily into talking about learning how to practice. Um, so what I would do if I were you guys, uh, maybe not now because uh, you know we want to be involved and present in this episode so we can all learn and participate and engage um, in it but I would um, the <laughs> I just read 
<laughs> San W44 Mag 29's comment, stick to the hotels, big guy. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, it's like $15,000 down the drain. Oh my gosh. But uh, anyways, what I would do if I were you guys is um, uh, like save that link, go to that link on your phone or something, keep it open and, uh, and then just play around with it. I have a video on my YouTube channel that kind of talks about the purpose of the shoot analysis sheet, how to run it, um, what it's made for, uh, some of the features of it and um, if you need help with it uh, and th then I would if you've shot a tournament recently I would use that shoot analysis sheet for that um, and, uh, and because you will need to use it to put together a good practice plan um, I would uh, I plan on and I would like to a video together of myself going through a shoot analysis sheet uh, I was thinking about trying to do it here uh, but because I only have one monitor in front of me it would be very hard to share a monitor and control the stream uh, so I probably will do that next week uh, where I'm going to take my own shoot analysis sheet from a tournament run through it and talk about how to pull information about what would be a good topic to practice and how to build it all together um, okay, cool. So uh, let's do about, let's say five minutes of answering some questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, I could have purchased another gun for that. Let's, but let's do about, uh, uh, about five minutes of answering any questions you guys may have related to the content of the podcast or unrelated, um, but not involving anything about my horrendous business uh, investments in uh, fancy podcast streaming episode uh uh, setups because clearly I am very unknowledgeable on that and have no experience in it and make terrible decisions so uh, we'll just open the floor for some questions and see where it goes so I hope that you guys look I, I gotta mention while I'm waiting for questions to come in I gotta mention that uh, so last week I was teaching down in Houston at West Side beautiful club I had took I, it was kind of fun I went and uh, took some really cool pictures out on the course so if you're curious in some of the photography of that club uh, go to my Facebook page I think and you can check it out uh, but it was beautiful weather like you could wear shorts um, uh, it was so nice sunny every day and then I come to Rochester another beautiful club amazing people uh, there's a bunch of you guys on here right now that I'm seeing uh, and it's been like normal weather for you guys and you're not you don't seem to be affected by it at all but I'm like I still can't feel my feet from five days ago <laughs> so we'll just uh, I've lost all my northern um, immunity to the cold goodness there seems to be like a really weird um, lag in the chat that I'm seeing uh, so I'm gonna pull it up on my uh, YouTube on my phone so if you guys see me looking down here that's what I'm doing also kind of weird setup I got a camera up here my monitor is down here and my mic is over here so if you see me looking around I do have ADHD but it's not because of that <laughs> um, it's very weird and impersonal looking into a camera over here when everything I'm looking at is down here so we'll see how that goes um, all right, let me scroll through these questions here. Okay, so the first question uh, that we have is from Texas Bass Guy 13. He said, Do you practice anything in particular for a specific shoot you're going to? Anything to get ready for Coyote Springs in particular? Um, that's a good and fair question. Um, I think that that'll be better answered later on in this episode in terms of uh, my best answer to give you, um, which is gonna be more about like uh, personal um, focused practice. So like how, how to take something that you really need to practice and build a plan around practicing it and then executing that practice plan. Um, but that is totally external and aside from uh, 
specific clubs or terrain or target setters. Um, when it comes to that type of stuff, um, you know, practicing for a club or uh, getting ready to practice for a tournament at a specific club that you may know there is a specific target setter or there's unique and different terrain. Um, yes, I do. T I do that type of practice uh, if I know if there that there's going. If, if I feel like I'm confident in assuming the information that I'm trying to assume to put together a plan, I can tell you that Coyote Springs. If you've never been there before, it's very flat. Uh, there's not really any terrain. Um, they uh, really care about the experience of the shooters there. So because of that, they compensate with that for generally having a good amount of towers and some really good towers. Um, I can't remember if there's any platforms or not. I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but the coloration of the background is very unique. You have a lot of uh, like just desert brush um, that's like a dark brown and then just the desert ground. There's not any grass uh, out on the courses. And so most of the targets thrown are in the air and they're black and because of that a lot of them tend to have really good lines to them uh, i don't mean straight lines when i say that i mean like very good sculpted lines so uh fairly technical target setting so um there i i know just it, um based off of just historical experience there uh, that they tend to throw good targets um, and are not afraid of throwing anything big. So I would say if you want to be, if you want to familiarize with something, familiarize yourself with something like that, I would, um, you know, if you can, if you can find a place to shoot a lot of birds in the air, if you want to get used to shooting a lot of blackbirds in the sky, uh, find a place that has a lot of, um, uh, you know, target setting that's not like really edgy. Um, flat line birds and then I would say work on shooting stuff with a lot of spring and probably about five to ten yards past your comfort zone um, and I think you should probably should be pretty good okay uh, and thanks for the question uh, Aldo says uh, tell us more about your suggestion for practice by gradually changing the break point um, let me read through the rest of the questions to see if I if it would be better suited for me to answer that in the content of the episode. Uh, and if not, I will just go right back to it. Um, okay, so San W forty four Mag twenty nine. He he uh, says I'm looking to shoot my first registered event at Nilo Farms next month. Do you have any advice for me? Um, And all you guys are asking very good questions for stuff that I want to talk about. <laughs> Let me keep going. Okay, T Hawk. T Hawk, is this TJ or is it somebody else? Let me know. Um, but uh, so your question is the station grading scores. I'm assuming you're talking about. Um, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the shoot analysis sheet, uh, but the station grading scores on the shoot analysis sheet, I'll add context, um, are we grading everyone's perceived difficulty or our own? I'm asking because a 25 yard crossing tower bird would be scored the same as a charity bird, for instance, in my opinion. Okay, so um, if you're running the shoot analysis sheet and you're, and you're inputting the information, that you have kind of two different formats to it. The first half is going to be the scorecard analysis. The second half is going to be the shooter analysis. The scorecard analysis has you put in your station scores um, and information for the scorecard, but it also adds a little bit of a subjective um, uh, grading category where you get to determine the difficulty of the station. So what it's doing is it uh, that it would it's it's allowing you to subjectively grade the difficulty of the station, but we're doing that subjectively based off of a definition that I am predefining for you. So I'm trying to add objectivity into the subjective aspect of the difficulty of the course. 
and the way that we that we should do it is based off of our own personal opinion. So um, realistically, the better shooter that you are, the lower numbers that you're going to have on the station difficulty. Um, the uh, the difficulty of those are defined as like if you give the station a, a difficulty of a one, that would mean that if you look at that pair in your head, you think. I should hit 100% of these. If you grade it a two, you should be able to say, or you're thinking, I should hit 85%. If you grade it a three, it would be, I should hit 75%. A four is a 65, and a five would be 50% or lower. Um, so uh, you would want to do that based off of your own personal opinion. It's uh, I will say that the purpose of that, not only to uh, bring in a sub, an objective subjectivity into the difficulty of the course, is also to get you to learn a very valuable underlying skill of recalling the pairs at a station. Um, I've had a couple people ask me questions about, you know, I don't understand how I'm supposed to do this while I'm shooting. It's really complex. There's so much information. It's distracting. And the answer to all of that, my response would be that that shoot analysis sheet is not something that you want to do uh, during your round. Um, the scorecard difficulty and, and analysis aspect of it, you want to do after your round. And uh, the way that I do it is I start on uh, the first station that I started on. Um, so if I start on station three, when I'm on the scorecard analysis part, I start with station three. And I go back and I replay in my head all the events, almost like I'm reliving a memory. I, I replay all the events from the moment that I got to the, got to the course. Um, and in my head, I'm just kind of like reliving the movie of what I did throughout the course in as much detail as I can to where uh, I go up and I'm seeing myself walk into the station. I'm seeing myself see the pair for the first time. And, I, and then I see the pair in my head uh, to remember what it looks like and then at that point I think okay how difficult was that I feel like I should have hit 100% of those okay that's a one and then um, I'll go to the next station in the same way I just try to relive those moments to help uh, work on memory recall and then I go through and I fill the whole course out that way why is that important because that skill set gets pulled up later on down the road when you start to get good enough mechanically where your physical mechanics and technique is not your lowest hanging fruit anymore. Essentially, we get to a point in our shooting where um, we don't miss targets because we don't know how to hit them. Instead, we miss targets because we either pick the wrong thing to do or uh, we, were, we had a great plan and for some reason we were unable to execute it correctly. So, um, if we start to develop a high level of recall in terms of being able to see the target and remember what it looks like just by going through and filling that out, then we also develop the ability to recall those memories when we see a pair that's similar or the same as something that we've already shot. And if that's the case, once you get good enough at this, you'll, you'll see that pair It'll recall a specific emotion or experience. You'll remember that presentation or target from before. And you may even be able to remember what you did and what you planned or whatever it was. And then you'll be able to make the assessment of did it work or did it not? Oh, it did not work when I did it that way that time. Let me try something else this time. And over time, essentially, what you're doing is you're eliminating bad mistakes based off of uh, round strategy. You're, you're, you're not uh, you're you're helping yourself not make the same mistake twice, so to speak. So that's why it's important to do it that way, um, among many other things. Um, but I'll I'll get more in detail with the shoot analysis sheet later on down the road when I do a full on video about how to use it. Um, um, let's see. So Armando, is, he's asking a question about practice uh, that I, I'll probably get into more. Hey, Bella, quit that. That's not for you. She's trying to eat my food. Um, 
uh, and I'll get I'll probably get into quickly or m in more detail later, but uh, I can answer this very quickly uh, right now. So it says I very rarely practice a competition format for pairs per station because I find it boring. Is it necessary to do it? My answer would be uh, not really. Um, you, it's helpful sometimes. Uh, but only in a specific type of practice, and that will make more sense later. Um, T Hawk, okay, so TJ, what's up, TJ? TJ says you mentioned in the last recorded podcast that you enjoy or put more effort into beautiful stations and presentations. How do you amp up for crappy, repetitive birds and boring stations? The answer is, if you figure the answer out to that question, uh, you let me know. <laughs> no. Um, the short answer to that question is that um, the, the I can I can be uh, bad targets, unimaginative targets, ugly courses, whatever it is uh, to me can it negatively influence my ability to focus and take it seriously. Not because I get bored or anything, but because. I, I get energized by those by the opposite of those things a beautiful area a nice view very creative and imaginative targets a, a challenging course I like problem solving so um, if I can I'm motivated by that and if the course is not that way for me then it's hard for me to feel motivated enough to do all that work um, and so what I do instead is I flip it uh, to where you'll kind of see me like on a course like that You'll see me, um, you know, kind of being a little bit more jovial, a little bit more um, social because I'm trying to pull in many different external sources of dopamine as I can uh, to try to just like maintain focus, maintain energy levels. Um, whereas on a course that really, really uh, grabs my attention and energizes me in that way, because of any of those variables, then I, it, I, it's so easy for me to focus that I can, you know, I'm, I'm going to be barely talking to anybody, very much in my own world, uh, and, and incredibly in my own head to where if you came up to talk to me, it might, for me it would almost feel like a conversation in the background of a restaurant, and I wouldn't, might not even answer you because I can't even really hear you. Um, uh, the man, I was not uh, expecting all of these questions. You guys are like on fire with this. Uh, Jeremiah says, New sponsor. Who's that's a good question. Who's the new sponsor? Uh, do I practice? <laughs> Dang it, Curtis. <laughs> I think that's Curtis. Yeah, see, it's really important. You have to like. Like this. You don't want. Nope. Never mind. Wrong finger. <laughs> the uh, your take on shooting a backup gun. The P gun is down, and I know my backup is close, but not quite perfect. Advice. Uh, b buy a new Parazzi. And um, <laughs> I just got a text from the person that asked me about the finger pointing. Uh, but I would say no. I'm kidding, dude. Um, the uh, my take on shooting a backup gun I personally don't have a backup gun I've got one gun um, the uh, I mean I'm, I'm not even joking I, I I don't even have another Parazzi not because I can't have one I don't I don't really want or need one um, I mean I've shot my gun uh, for a long time um, and I, I don't really worry about it uh going down in the middle of a round um the only time that it would uh you know that i wouldn't have is if i'm having something done to it um and so uh and if that is the case say like i'm just sending it in at the end of the year to just run be run through or something um the uh i i i I like to pick a fun gun to shoot, like a meaning like a gun that I'm not going to expect to do well. Um, the uh, like either I might go to a couple tournaments with a side by side or something like that. But I will say that I also purposefully plan those moments to be not around good or important tournaments. 
um, if you have the unfortunate circumstance to where it goes down during a big tournament um, then you know um, I, I mean the approach that I would take is I don't like practicing I don't I, I wouldn't advise somebody to practice with a backup gun unless the backup gun is uh, you know is an identical version of the one that they shoot because um, the, I don't know that's a great question I, I think it's all personal preference I know there's a lot of guys that have two guns that are identical and they practice back and forth with them and they switch them out so something does happen it's not a psychological thing um, but I, I become very in tune with my own gun and I don't want to give that away by working with another gun uh, you know, I mean, it's like a, you got to develop a relationship. No. But yeah, my, my long long story short, um, I would say use it as an excuse to enjoy it with a fun hunting gun or a side by side or a 28 gauge or something like that. Um, because the reality of it is, you don't have the, the time behind that gun as the one that that's in the shop right now. Probably doesn't fit you as good. It doesn't move as good, and so uh, you don't want to ruin your time shooting because you're expecting the same results. Uh, yeah, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the star of the show is back here. She's missing you. Um, and she already had dinner. Okay, uh, let's see. We got... Oh, so, oh that's... Ju okay, so Sam, that's Justin. Um, so Justin... Um, Reclarify your question real quick about how do I keep myself from being drained mentally? Um, do you mean during a tournament or just normal? Let's see. Oh, the side ribs came loose. That's a bummer. I'm sorry to hear that, Duke. But uh, let me know who you sent it to. Okay, I think I may have gotten through all the questions. Let me see. All right, yeah, I think I got through all the questions that um, that I that I could answer that don't relate to what I'm going to talk about for this episode. So I might just jump in real quick to that. And I just got a. Uh, message saying that there was a picture sent. Let's see. Oh my gosh, apparently we've got a spam uh, bot in the chat. Well, uh, thank you for letting me know that. <laughs> gosh. I do not endorse the, uh, the chat bot of uh, telling you that you can find love in your town today um so that's not, that's not a new sponsor man what's the world coming to during a tournament this is considered mine with my first competition coming up oh okay oh no duke sorry to hear that you dropped your barrel while you were cleaning it that's a bummer um, okay, so how do I keep myself from being drained mentally f during a tournament? It's a concern of mine with the first co competition coming up. Uh, so I would say that I don't really think if it's your first tournament that you're going to get drained mentally. You may feel overwhelmed, um, but I would say... Hmm. It's a question that you don't want to answer off the spur of your head because you want to give good advice. Uh, how would you how would you prevent yourself from feeling drained or overwhelmed during a tournament? I think that it's really just a marriage of of the outlook that you have and the uh, the expectations that you have and maybe the level of preparedness that you have going into it um, and making sure that you align all of those things. 
uh, and what the purpose is for the tournament. So, you know, if, if the purpose of going to that tournament is to be a true test of your ability and you're, you have high expectations for your performance, probably not, probably not a good, um, you know, filter for why you, uh, or, or for going to that match. I would say for your first tournament, I would go to enjoy the experience. I would go to um, meet people you haven't been able to meet yet. I would go to soak in what it's like to be at a tournament. Um, it's a lot different than going to shoot a round that is a tournament course, but in practice. Um, don't get overwhelmed. Don't uh, like. Don't get overwhelmed by the newness and the complexity of some of the things that are happening around you. You know, you might not understand the format of certain things or the uh, or the the process of how everything happens. And um, and uh, and I would say, you know, don't put the you know make sure that you don't start to assume. Uh, what other people are thinking and and get outside of your own head and build up a bunch of anxiety about uh, about what other people think you know I know from my own personal experience there's so many people that you know their first tournament they're so worried about what other people will think if they do something wrong or they mess it up um, that uh, you know that it, it it'll it clouds their focus I would say a really good piece of advice I can give you I almost just shut my computer off by accident <laughs> that would have been bad a, uh, a really a really good piece of advice I could give you would be to um, you know when you get to the match and you get to the station you're supposed to start on with your squad just tell them like hey guys this is my first tournament and I've I, I'm, I might not I don't know you know what I'm supposed to do um, and I don't really know you know some of the things that are kind of common knowledge and so, um, you know, please feel free to, you know, help me guide, you know, help guide me through this. And, uh, and if I'm doing anything wrong or if you have any advice for me, please feel free to tell me. And I also, I apologize if I do anything that's going to mess you up. And if you just preemptively have that conversation, that pressure will be off of you and it will allow them to feel like they can talk to you about it. It will relieve a lot of the things that cause external stressors and anxiety for you and kind of allow you to just be in your in your own mindset uh, running through your process and I will say that make sure that you trust your shots and you trust that gun and you trust looking at it and executing the mechanics and remember before every time you call pull what it feels like and looks like to do it right and when I say what it looks like to do it right I don't mean what the lead looks like I mean what how much of the target you see how slow it looks the detail how it feels that think about that before you call pull for every shot and you'll be good okay texas bass guy says when you hit a wall in practice and feel like you're in a rut with a particular target or pair do you bail go to another and come back to it or double down figure out the correct move and grind this is a very personality-based question. Um, different people have a completely different response to this. Um, and uh, in the middle of that, I just saw Jeremiah's text. Yes, this episode will be posted and saved. So if you have to go to sleep, feel free to uh, leave and it'll, it will be here not only on YouTube, but also this episode will get released audio only to podcast apps. So thanks for showing up. And have a good day at work. Um, okay, so back to the question. Um, it's a very personality-based question, and um, you know, certain people are going to have a, comp a literally a 180-degree opposite response. Um, for me personally, well, let me ask your let me answer your question first. I think that the most important thing to do is what you want to do, because if my personality is that I cannot leave that area until I have figured out the problem and uh, and then gotten to the point where I feel very confident and happy with the solution that I've determined it to be or and then I feel like I can execute it over and over again successfully um, and so 
Um, I've practiced with a lot of people that are not that way and they always are like, come on, let's go. You, you know, you can come back to it later. And that aggravates me so much because the way that my brain works is I, I will not be able to leave that moment in my head. Like I won't be able to go do anything else until I have figured that thing out. So um, doing anything other than sitting there and grinding through it is just point it's it's a it's it's a waste of effort and time and uh probably will make me just frustrated <laughs> um i mean i've even had times you know um where i was working on something and i couldn't figure it out i couldn't figure it out couldn't figure it out it got to be so dark i couldn't see anymore i tried shooting just couldn't see and i and i literally i it bothered me so much i couldn't go to sleep because I kept thinking about it, so I went and literally the first thing I did in the morning was go out and shoot some more. I finally, finally figured it out by like noon, and um, I think it was almost fourteen hundred shells later. That's a real story, <laughs> and I hate to admit that, but it's true. So if I were to do anything else, it would be a terrible mistake for me. But you know what you intuitively resp how you intuitively respond to that situation and i would say the most important thing would be to do what you do uh, because you don't want to be having an internal battle with yourself um, you know if you're somebody that gets stuck stuck on problems and you need to figure them out to progress forward do that if you're somebody that that you know through your own self-awareness that when you have a problem like that you tend to get frustrated before it, uh, you know too early um, and if you were to stay there it would accomplish nothing and you need to remove yourself from the situation to clear your mind then do that um, but the the short answer is that you need don't take anybody else's advice for what they do unless it aligns with how you feel uh, Max wants to know if the shoot analysis sheet can be used in tr in skeet or trap yeah, the shoot analysis can be used uh, even in practice. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, that's awesome to hear, Justin, about your con. Very good. Okay. I think we're going to jump into the content. And uh, I will try to... Uh, pay attention to the chat uh, as I go but um, don't if I haven't answered your question by the end of this feel free to ask it again because uh, I know my tendency to uh, get too focused on something and then completely forget about something else so um, the question for today's episode is how to practice that's the boiled down question. How do I practice? How do I build a practice plan um, so that it keeps me on track towards uh, accomplishing my goals and, it, and so that it does it for me in as efficient as a pathway as possible? Um, there's a couple questions that go along with that. Um, again, before I get into the depth of this, I do want to say this is going to be a uh, uh, kind of like a shallow version of all of this. I don't want to go crazy into depth where I'm giving you examples and drills because that's going to be coming up next. And your homework after this episode, well, I really felt like a school teacher there. I didn't like that. Uh, I would suggest after this episode that if you want to take advantage of what we're trying to work on and how I'm trying to teach you to do this, I would suggest that what you try to do is use the tools that I'm going to talk about to build your own practice plan for this weekend and then go and try to follow your practice plan and then either take notes or uh, I'm going to actually try to, um, you know what, I will put a survey up that's like the shoot analysis sheet on my website and it will allow you to submit what your practice plan was and then put together some notes about uh, how the experience went, if you felt like you learned anything, if you felt like it didn't work, and it'll just ask a bunch of questions like that. Um, so I would that, that's what I would suggest that you guys do. Put together a plan, 
try to execute it, go practice it, take notes, try to remember important concepts from it, and then bring that information back to the next episode that we have on here because I'm going to use you guys personally to pull you in on the episode and discuss what you learned, what you felt like you never got to, um, and, uh, and, and then kind of like guide and coach you through it. Um, so because I'm going to be suggesting that, again, I don't want to give you specific drills because if I do, I don't want you guys cheating and then just using the drills that I give you. Uh, I want you to try to, to creatively come up with your own that will allow you to do what I'm about to talk about. Uh, sound good? Sounds good. Okay, so the first, after we ask, after the whole initial question of uh, how do I practice, um, the first thing that we want to, to basically try to answer is what do I practice? Um, and the uh, I would say that I'm trying to be nice here, but I think it'd be better if I'd be honest. <laughs> um, I think almost everybody doesn't doesn't practice as good as they can, um, and almost everybody that uh, that I've ever talked to about about how they practice not to their own fault it's not their fault um, but they have actually a little bit of the wrong outlook on what practice should be and what their idea of practice is holistically and and in a completely all-encompassing way is really what just one very little subset of practice should be and that is going and uh, and just shooting, either shooting a course or, you know, the very common thing of, you know, going and shooting, you know, 10 pairs or doing um, a grid or doing, um, you know, even some of the videos that I've released uh, with the dead pair guys um, with uh, a little practice drill of working break po different break points or, or uh, you know, any of those things. Um, those, I'm not saying those are invalid ways to practice. Those are valid ways to practice, but it's one subset of practice. And that subset is target practice. Um, and I like to try to, to unpack practice into everything involved in shooting. Um, and so if I, you know, if we if we look back onto the last episode that uh, I did as a recorded episode, I talked about a bunch of different important categories and things that are, you know, really good to be able to, you know, things that you have to incorporate in order to accomplish your goals. And one of the things that I said, uh, one of the topics that I covered was uh, self awareness and self assessment. And uh, I talked about the the difference of the two, um, a self awareness being just like an a, 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 an a real time understanding of your physical state, your emotional state, your the your visual abilities, your personality, how your personality trends towards how you handle different situations, the way that you respond to your own emotions. Uh, all that kind of stuff. If you want more information on that, then go back to uh, the first episode of the of the recorded episodes of the Journey Podcast, and uh, look through the timestamps, and you'll find the self analysis and self assessment. Click that and start the podcast at that point. Um, but I talk a lot about that, and so that's the self awareness. And the self-assessment I talk about being heavily involved with the shoot analysis sheet for me, um, but also some other tools like literally you can you can do a self-assessment without a shoot analysis sheet. You can do it in your head. You can do it on the way home from the club where you're going back and processing everything that happened and trying to make sense of it. You can do it uh, in a shooting journal. You can do it in voice memos on your phone by as soon as you're done with the round. Um, 
you know, uh, you can, uh, you know, just talk into your phone for 30 minutes on the way home and just stream of consciousness, you know, uh, just let words out that of you trying to narrate what happened and the decisions you made and how you felt and, and all these things. And basically the self-assessment is, uh, is collecting data about yourself and your performances and analyzing it. And then the self-awareness is being aware of all the different, uh, all the different characteristics and qualities and, uh, um, a proficiency levels in different categories that you have so um, because this is uh, my podcast and because I'm gonna do it in a way where I'm trying to to use the way that I teach people to help you I would recommend uh, using the shoot analysis sheet and um, as far as understanding what to practice um, so a, a little um, kind of like the first step that you would do is you you want to structure your practice around what is currently your lowest hanging fruit so basically you want to be able to say okay what is the thing that is affecting that is negatively affecting my performance the most right now and at the same time would be the easiest thing to correct or to build skill in. Um, you can, the best way that you can do that is to use a tournament as a self-assessment to analyze the performance of that tournament to find the lowest hanging fruit that you have. Um, just saw the chat thing go. I want to make sure I'm not going to miss a good question. Uh, okay, so um, you can use a tournament as a way to self-assess. If you use the shoot analysis sheet, you don't really have to think about and critically analyze your performance to determine what the lowest hanging fruit is. It will tell you, and that's why I really like it because you can go through and just answer questions uh, about what you did. And it will tell you, like it, you, you ask questions like, uh, or I mean you answer questions that are basically asking you about, um, you know, did you put effort into planning your break points and, your, and planning your mechanics and finding a focal point and thinking about X, Y, Z and then did you put effort into being emotionally self-aware? Did you put it, you know, you go through and answer all these questions of did you do this or did you not? And then you rank it on a scale of zero to 10. And then it processes all that information through a bunch of formulas and, and, uh, and stuff. And then it will say, okay, look, um, these are the categories that you perform the best in. These are the categories that you perform the worst in. These are the categories that will be the easiest to improve for you and they will improve your score by X amount. Um, and then uh, it will tell you things like, um, you know, this is what your score would have been if the course difficulty was perfectly average. Um, this is, you know, the best possible score that you could have shot today based off of what you believe the course difficulty to be and the current uh, level of effort that you put into this round and what that allows you to score um, a bunch of stuff like that and so it breaks it down into categories and it summarizes data and makes assumptions off of the input of information that you have but then also you can go down and scroll down and you can individually look at your answers for different questions to see which specific questions that you uh, you know perform poorly on and then you can also look at category and subcategory information where um, you know you can say okay well how was I in the planning stage of my in event routine how was I in the research phase how was I uh, performing in um, the uh, you know my level of uh, execution 
in my visual mechanics? How was I performing in my planning for my visual mechanics or my uh, research phase of my visual mechanics? So it breaks it down into things like visual mechanics, physical mechanics, um, self-awareness, uh, uh, presence, things like that and the you know main overarching categories but then also each one of those categories is broken down into subcategories and you get scores and data for that it tells you things like how many points remaining in each one of those things there are it tells you how much influence each one of those things has on your score so long story short it's a very easy way of breaking down your round into uh, into all the things that were involved in in allowing in getting you to shoot that score once you have that information you now have an analysis of the last performance that you had and as human beings we don't you know as we progress through time uh, our strengths and weaknesses in a game like shooting are fluidly changing um, you know you may go from day to day and the thing that you were really good at on Saturday you were terrible with on Sunday and vice versa um, the if that is the case then um, congratulations you're normal <laughs> yeah. um, The, okay, I'm going to interrupt that thought real quick. I got two questions. Uh, any advice on how to improve on far targets? I've been successful on most targets, 30 to 35 yards in, but when the range increases, my hit percentage goes way down. I can summarize that for you quickly like this. Take the same exact target and shoot it at 30 yards. Okay, we're going to, let's take a 25 yard crosser, a little bit of a transition, so kind of a complex line. And let's say at a 25 yards, from your hold point to your break point, your gun has to move this much. Walk closer to it and get 15 yards away. If you measure the same hold points and break points, it's now this much, uh, this much space. Walk backwards 20 yards to where you're at 35 yards and where this was 25, now you're here, those same two points. And basically, the further you get back, the smaller and smaller that line is going to get. Not just from your hole point and your break point, but literally from where the trap is until where it hits the ground. Why is it important to talk about that? Because if we are struggling with birds that are far, there are generally two variables that are influencing that. The first one is just the geometry and the angles of the fact that the further away we get, the smaller the total move becomes. And the smaller that the total move becomes, the more precision that is required to make it be a good move. Things that influence precision are balance, control of the gun, good visual information, controlling your uh, level of anxiety that influences bad movement, making sure that your movement comes from your body rather than your hands making sure that you are not being too anticipatory in your start or um, or lagging too much in your move um, and, and things like that so in order to get good at further targets mechanically we have to get good at controlling the gun in a very precise way that's not something that comes easily early on in the game you have to work with I would recommend working with a coach that can teach you body mechanics and movement styles to refine that movement so that you have the same level of precision far away as you do close. I will say on the reverse spectrum of that, really, really close targets are can sometimes be equally difficult because the movement is so big that sometimes we can't even make that movement. Um, go to that example of changing distances in the target and we have, uh, you know, the that same bird is not changing speeds the closer or further away that you get, but the closer or further away that you get, the perceived speed or the felt speed will change uh, because the, the bird is going the same distance over the same amount of time, but two-dimensionally for you, that same distance for it is getting smaller. Um, so that's why it's very hard. Um, 
the other variable involved in shooting targets that are far that makes them harder is that exactly what I just said about those angles. If you, I hate to talk about lead and what I'm about to say does not mean that I uh, recommend you aiming when you shoot. But I have to use this example as a way to explain to you what is happening. Let's say that at 25 yards, the target that you're shooting requires five feet of lead. And let's say that at 40 yards, I'm gonna go crazy, and we'll say that the bird requires 10 feet of lead. Put a 10 foot stick out at 40 yards and a five foot stick at 20 or 25 yards and look at which one looks bigger. You doubled the distance, but in terms of how close it or far away it was, but I mean, it, the size of that stick would not change. Also, you would not double the lead to go from 25 to 40 yards on the same exact bird. So what I'm trying to say here is that even though the lead may actually increase at the target, the way that you would per perceive the lead to be is probably going to decrease. So that means that your gun is closer to the target on a two-dimensional space for targets that are further away. If that's the case, it increases our level of barrel awareness, which makes it hard to trust the shot, look at the bird, and, and move the gun proprioceptively. So you have to have very good uh, visual discipline and a lot of trust alongside of the good mechanics that I talked about. Um, hopefully that answers your question. And um, the... Uh, Sorry, I went off on a tangent, but I can't answer questions in a quick, shallow, one answer, uh, one sentence answer because it's not possible. <laughs> not for me, but the answer to that question requires that explanation. Um, uh, Banson Lego says, um, hey, David, I'm having a hard time finding a coach in South Florida. Do you have any suggestions? Um, I do, but they're all my friends and in an effort of just in real time answering that question and um, just not thinking of somebody that I normally would think about. I don't want to upset anybody. Um, so send me an email. Um, I don't want to just accidentally just forget to say somebody and then make it sound like I'm not endorsing them. Uh, but um, send me an email to... Uh, podcast at dredulovich.com and I'll give you a, a more thought through answer of who I would recommend. Uh, also, I'm, I teach down in South Florida a couple times a year. I will be there in a couple weeks as well. So um, you always have that option and that's available to you to book on my website, uh, the dredulovich.com website. I'm a really good salesman. I completely forget to talk about myself. <laughs> um Okay, now back to what I was talking about with the uh, practice. I'm wondering if my dog is alive. Well, are you learning anything here? <laughs> you got any advice for these guys? <laughs> Believe it or not, my dog has uh, been to more shooting lessons than probably any other animal so I think she's fairly qualified to uh, instruct some yeah I know okay <laughs> okay I have to go back to work yes I know I know okay um, okay so um, going back into the practice and we talking about the shoot analysis sheet and being able to um, run an analysis on your performance to identify the lowest hanging fruit or inefficiencies in your execution of your mechanics or whatever category. Basically, summarization of what I was saying was um, in order to figure out what you need to practice, you first need to uh, be able to run an analysis that tells you objectively the things that are hurting your score the most. Um, the... Uh, yeah, Bella, Bella says, Uncle Curtis is on the chat. I want to say hello. <laughs> um, but in order to do all of that, 
Um, I'm suggesting that you use the shoot analysis sheet because it takes the heavy thinking out of the equation and makes it easy for you. So um, now the next question is, if that is, um, you know, if that's the approach that we're going to take for uh, determining what our lowest hanging fruit is, then what do we do after we figure out what the lowest hanging fruit is and, and how do we pick what to practice? Okay, so I'm gonna give a few examples of um, how you would probably go about doing this. Let's say that you run a shoot analysis sheet on a tournament, and I'm gonna give you a strange category. Um, we will use one of my favorite ones, actually it's not that strange, but we'll say uh, visual mechanics. So let's say the overarching main category that the shoot analysis sheet tells you that um, you are performing the, the most poorly in and that you have the biggest opportunity for growth in is your visual mechanics. Uh, I'm gonna throw it out to you guys listening. What type of thing do you think you could do in practice if you felt like you needed to get better at visual mechanics? And I'm purposely not gonna tell you what that is. You know, uh, when I'm teaching in class, in a classroom, it's much less awkward to, an to ask a question because you can immediately look at people and intimidate them into answering their question that you just gave them. But when you're doing a YouTube video that has 20 seconds of delay, you start to feel a little bit like an idiot asking a question and having to sit there in silence. <laughs> Okay, so Duke is, is saying visualization, question mark. Not a bad estimation. Um, the, uh, so, I'll wait to see if we got one more answer. Oh, here we go. Cool. Here we go. We're getting some. We're getting some answers. There we go, guys. The delay is real, though. I'll tell you that. Um, okay, so we have spent some time without the gun, but watch clays and focus on how and what you see. We have adjusting gun and visual hold point to match the speed in a natural spot. We have, of course, visualized doing it correctly. Um, yeah, I would say. Um, I would say that all of those could be correct. Um, I may possibly put visualization inside of a routine as a pre-shot routine uh, category, but it makes sense that you would want to put that into the visual mechanics category. Um, but we've got some more answers. We'll try to consciously make an effort to really focus hard on the clay by picking out a feature or a line or a shade. Uh, look at still targets at different distances. Okay, so these are all good. Um, uh, these are all really good um, suggestions and so yes let's say if you were if you were performing poorly in visual mechanics and any of those things that you all have mentioned could be uh, one of the things that are encompassed in the visual mechanics category then and if we were trying to build a practice routine around getting better at that then yeah we may want to um, you know, uh, the, the answer here that I think is um, uh, probably the first step in what I would do is what Curtis said, where he says, uh, spend some time without the gun, but watch clays and focus on how and what you see. So the way what, that I would translate that would be that if I'm performing poorly in my visual mechanics, and that means that I'm doing something in the process of how I'm using my eyes and, and, and how and what I'm able to see because of how I'm using them, 
uh, that's negatively influencing my ability to connect with the, with the bird, to create harmony and visualize uh, uh, harmony and synchronization with the bird physically. Um, and so I want to be able to better understand what I can change and influence um, in order to change the result of, of uh, the process that I'm using with my eyes. So the first step that I would take would be a little bit of uh, exploration and not even using the gun uh, to modify focal points in the XY axes you know like going up and down the line with focal points uh, changing and influencing the depth of my vision um, changing and influencing uh, you know this is going to be a, a weird one for some people I'm, uh, but basically like um, separating where my center ocular position is with what part of my vision I'm consciously paying attention to. That may seem like a strange thing to, to say, but um, it's actually possibly, can possibly be very useful. So it would be like, okay, um, I may have a focal point, like the XY location of my eyes on the target line may be in this place, and the trap may be here, but as I'm looking in very intently right here, and I'm practicing the finger pointing, Curtis, <laughs> but as I'm looking very intently right here in the XY location, and the trap is here, I'm going to let myself get to a very calm state and position, uh, physically, uh, state emotionally, uh, to where I can drag my conscious attention to this part of my vision, because I wanna be able to be to, to have my vision stimulated when there's movement there and allow my eyes to engage in smooth pursuit movement with the bird. Um, let me also say right now, because this will be released on uh, an audio version only, um, if you're listening to this podcast, an audio version uh, through a podcast app and you kind of think it's weird the way I'm explaining things is because I'm also using video um, and the, uh, the best way to uh, listen to these after the fact that they're live is to go to YouTube and watch uh, the videos. I'll, I'll also say though that this particular episode being one of the first ones that we're doing and because of the fact that uh, I'm in a hotel right now with a modular setup, I'm not gonna be able to be, do a lot of the stuff that I will do be able to do later on in episodes, so not super important that you are watching this on YouTube right now. Um, but anyways, um, uh, yeah, all of those different things are things that we can do in the visual mechanics. So that would be step one. One, you know, it's an example of step one that I may do if I'm trying to to practice visual mechanics. Um, uh, visual mechanics also include things like. The, the length of time at which I'm visually titrating my focus. Um, and is there a way to influence that? Uh, it also, uh, yes, uh, Damon has a great example, practicing your breathing exercises you gave Allie to produce oxygen levels, uh, to increase the oxygen levels in your bloodstream that will influence uh, you're, you're basically allowing your eyes to send data to the visual cortex of your brain and then to your brain so that you see uh, you see slower so to speak um, the uh, yeah, again yeah Curtis um, he's Curtis says go watch good players play tennis from various angles to train your eyes to see and believe and connect understand the blur versus clarity and becoming comfortable with movement not detail becoming your trigger to begin seeing that is a huge one um, one that uh, a lot of shooters don't fully understand which is that we don't want to start our movement in our body once we've established clarity we want to start our movement in our body once the bird starts so that way we can establish clarity, uh, and, or we can establish harmony with the bird, and that as we visually titrate our focus on the target, um, we are doing that at the same time as creating physical movement with the target. 
which allows us not to break our conscious attention on the target because both of those things are being overlapped. Um, trying to decide if I want to go in depth with some of the stuff with the eyes now or later. I'm going to save it for later. Um, yeah, I'll save it for later. I don't want to go, I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> I need you guys to be able to try to come up with something so we can talk about it later. So, um, okay, so if these are the things that are important for, uh, you know, f to grade yourself on in the visual mechanics category, then now my next question for you guys would be, what kind of thing could I do in practice that would help me get better at those things. And um, this is where it gets a little bit confusing for people uh, because I think that a lot of people have the right intentions but um, just may not have the knowledge and understanding of how to actually go about doing it. And what I mean by all that is that, you know, you can put together a really good practice plan. You can say like, okay, um, you know, we'll use, we'll use the visual mechanics as an example. And do I want to, man, I'm struggling with, if I give you an example of something, uh, I'll just do it. And if somebody has a shoot analysis sheet that has this random combination of categories and subcategories, then um, you got lucky I'm giving you a cheat code answer, <laughs> okay? But try to come up with your own thing because the pr I'm trying to teach you a way to think about how to put these types of things together as opposed to just give you answers because if I just give you answers then you can only make progress if I'm there and um, if I teach you how to think right you don't need you can do it yourself you can you need a coach to help you refine things and guide you along the way and teach you things that you don't know but as far as the things that you already know how to do you you know and I'm just a terrible salesman I'm telling you not to pay me <laughs> But it's true, you don't need that. And I'm, you know, and uh, you don't, you, uh, yeah. So basically, let's say we'll go visual mechanics again, okay? And um, I'm specifically gonna use visual mechanics because I want to show that you can have a practice routine for things other than physical mechanics. Um, the an example would be the shoot analysis sheet is telling you that you have a low the lowest score in visual mechanics and inside of your visual mechanics your execution phase is the lowest out of the research planning and execution phases so your research phase is the low I mean your execution phase is the lowest but in all the subcategories combined, your lowest subcategory and your worst subcategory is your research phase. So holistically across all the main categories, you performed very low in research. Specifically, in the main category of visual mechanics, that was your worst. And inside of the visual mechanics, your research was not the worst subcategory, but your execution was. What in the world could we deduce from that? Well, ignoring all the other data and just talking about that, we can say that first off we would need to look at what what the metrics are in visual mechanics what's involved in the visual mechanics it's the the eye stuff version of the body t and shooting technique that you use so we could say okay 
all across the board, I was really bad at researching what to do. Research phase is, de is defined as absorbing the information that you will need to put together a good plan so that you can execute it once you get in the box. So across all boards, you are not very good at researching things. And with your visual mechanics being your worst category, you, you basically did not perform well in your execution. So we could say that um, this is actually really exciting. I randomly kind of put this together in a way that is cool. Uh, so with, uh, <laughs> I feel like you guys are gonna think I'm like way too analytical with this one, but this is a really, this is the kind of stuff you can get from this. Um, I gotta think about how to explain it. So, if we look at the subcategories of like research, planning, and execution, if in most of the other things your research is bad, that means that in your physical mechanics your research is going to be bad. Your um, your awareness is going. Uh, research and awareness are kind of like. Uh, uh, I believe the right word would be like a synonym. I know they're not actually synonyms, but in terms of the shooting analysis uh, sheet, um, there are some main categories that have a, a subcategory of awareness, and there are some that have a, main, a subcategory of research. Those two things are the same thing in relation to those main categories. Research of physical mechanics is pulling and researching like target information, the line, the speed, the all that kind of stuff so that you can put together a good mechanical plan to then execute. Research for visual mechanics is where do I hold my eyes, where do I see it best, all that kind of stuff. Um, but awareness in your emotional state is pulling together the information of how do I feel? What emotions am I experiencing? Why am I experiencing those emotions? Um, awareness in um, your presence is basically like, uh, you know, being aware that, you know, um, you, because of the fact that you are feeling a certain way, it's going to influence your decision making and it might influence your ability to do X, Y, and Z. Um, take, for example, um, <laughs> my hat. I'm in New York, Hoss. I know that you live uh, you live up north and you're used to the cold, but listen, I've been uh, even in my hotel, it's freezing cold and I have to wear a hat. <laughs> um, anyways, the uh, so let's say with the visual mechanics that um, because of the fact that you did a poor job of being aware of your body and your physical state and your emotions that you were experiencing, that means that you were unaware of how those things influence your eyes. If we're very anxious and we have a lot of anticipatory anxiety and we have a lot of physical tension um, and we're feeling rushed and nervous because of that, well, that would influence your eyes in the and come through in making them very jumpy off the start of a line of a bird. It would make them, uh, you would have a harder time uh, flipping into smooth pursuit vision and uh, not being able to get out of psychotic movement of your eyes because of, of how that you're processing things. Um, if you're feeling that way emotionally and physically, it would influence how fast you see the targets. They would look faster and less detailed. Um, it would heighten your emotional response to birds. So you would, when you see a really fast, edgy, quartering away bird um, that makes you nervous because it looks like it's going really fast, you're going to be more apt to respond to it in bad physical movement as opposed to controlled and refined movement. That's what happens if we don't have a good research and awareness um, uh, subcategories. If you pull that into the visual mechanics and you have bad execution, your execution and your visual mechanics 
and let's say your research phase in the visual mechanics was good and your planning was really good. You may have came up with a really awesome plan to do with your eyes and it was super detailed and when you were researching that plan and rehearsing it when you were not shooting, you were able to do everything in your plan and that's why you thought it was a good plan. But because of the fact that you were not able to um, be aware of how you were feeling while you were shooting in other stations and throughout the rounds and connect the dots that you didn't put together the fact that what your plan entailed was all a bunch of different things that are very hard if not impossible to do in the emotional and physical state that you're in and you decided to ha have really tight focal points and uh, not allow your eyes time to visually titrate and focus and you planned a break point very close to the moment in time when the bird slows down and you immediately grab uh, the bird and initiate smooth pursuit vision in your eyes all these things so it's an awesome plan you put a lot of research into it but the, because of the fact that you were unaware of how your shooting was influencing your emotional state the research that you put in was invalid because it was all based off of when you were calmer and not in the box and you didn't preemptively plan for how that would change when you did get into the box and um, and then all of this uh, and then that, that all led to not being able to execute it well not because you have the in a, you don't have the ability to execute it well but because you were unaware of all those other things happening that uh, that blocked your ability to execute your visual mechanics well. How would we put together a practice plan for that? We would want to put together a practice plan that teaches us how to control and how to be aware of what different things, meaning what different states of emotion, what different levels of energy, what different levels of focus, what different um, uh, s levels of physical tension and anxiety influence how we see. And then we would want to be able to put together a plan that um, helps us learn when we are in those different states, what's the best option available to us? A purposefully picked, I, I tried to come up with something that is very, very complex, but involved a bunch of different things that we can cross, uh, a, 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 cross into a bunch of different categories so that I could put together a plan that involves a lot of things because I don't, not very many of you will be able to, at this stage of your game, put together all those dots and then make the assumption that I just made from that person that we just theorist, theoretically came up with. I can't speak English. Um, uh, I can help you do that if you if you book a call uh, after you do your shoot analysis sheet. But some of you, you know, will be at the stage where the plan that you need to build is very simply based off of a specific mechanic that comes back in your shoot analysis sheet. So I picked something like that to show you the complexity that you can have, but also so that I can talk in detail about it without really telling you guys anything. <laughs> because I really want you guys to try to work to put together a plan for yourself. Um, the uh, Man, Taylor's giving me the shade in there. Uh, okay, I'm reading the questions. You guys are dogging me. I'm learning not to go on such long explanations because I, I lose track of chat and then it becomes abusive and I'm triggered. <laughs> okay, okay. Now that I just went on that long explanation of all that craziness, I'm gonna open it up to a few questions because I want, I realize that I'm giving details of things that are, that kind of may just be super off in the weeds and probably some of you are picking up some things, but um, I wanna give you some time to 
to possibly ask for clarification um, or you know uh, ask me to re-explain something or ask me to simplify something as you do that I'm just gonna go grab I'm just gonna you know wait 20 seconds uh, and I'm gonna grab a water or some I'm gonna try to find something um, to drink because Uh, I don't yeah okay so we'll let's see what this does I hope I don't lose it Okay, that didn't work. I was trying to make a transition that apparently is not already loaded into this computer. So I'm just gonna be right back. I'm gonna try to find something to drink. And as I go to do that, I will be paying attention to the YouTube uh, comments so that way I can put together, uh, I can start to answer some of your questions. Okay. Is this hat better for you guys? <laughs> How's that? We had to make a quick wardrobe change. <laughs> Cur 
artist. I wonder how many people are going to get that joke. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's pretty good. Um... <laughs> Oh, Jason, that's awesome. I'm glad you got one. I got mine right in the corner right here. I'll pull it out. I hope that you guys didn't see my, uh, my gun case. I grabbed the wrong one and put it in, but here's my high tech. She's a beaut. Nice and worn in. Look at that. I had to get a new stock. It used to have uh, oh, like fingerprints in it from where my hands went, but the high tech is an awesome gun. I'm very happy to be able to shoot it. And the coolest thing about Prats is that they're just infinitely customizable. You totally a bespoke gun, not just the stock dimensions, but everything about the barrels, uh, everything, every metal piece on the gun is fully customizable. It's, it's a, an amazing product. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> I do need a new <laughs> a new hat like my vest changes at nationals. Um, oh, awesome chokes! Uh, that's very good. Fixed chokes are the way to go. Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna scroll up real quick and look at your questions. Um, let's see. God dang, you guys are brutal. Okay, Craig Porter has the first real question. I wish I had an award that I could give you for not dogging me and asking a, a, a legitimate question. Everybody else is in the doghouse and you, your suggested homework is now required. Um, <laughs> and there's gonna be a quiz on Monday and uh, it's 40% of your grades. Okay, so anyways, Craig's question is, staying with the visual mechanics, talk about going from soft focus to hard focus as the target moves. Um, great question, and I'll have a really interesting answer for you. Uh, the, something's making noise there, I hope it's not. Can you guys still hear me okay? The, my uh, audio interface is like clicking, I wanna make sure it's, it's still, still good. Yeah, the new stock, Curtis, does not have, it doesn't have the uh, the soul as the old one, but soon it will. It will get worn in. Um, okay. Anyways, to answer your question, Craig, uh, soft focus and hard focus is a, um, is like a shooter's explanation for uh, the way that I think I could explain this using the term biologically our eyes work but maybe I'm wrong um, doesn't seem right but I'm gonna go with it uh, the there's not it's just a way of simplifying what is actually happening um, and soft focus versus hard focus is mechanically dependent Meaning that depending on the style that you use to shoot, using soft focus is a requirement or um, non-existent. So I'll explain what I mean by that. If, Let me preface this by saying that I'm not saying that a certain mechanical technique or technical approach to shooting is better than the other. They're both equally correct, uh, but they just both require two different things. And I like to look at shooting as a kind of two different, um, two, two different approaches. One would be the style of shooting that I uh, use which is also like what Wendell Cherry uses or Tom C or um, you could 
you could say it's like the style of shooting that kind of falls under the theme of move mount shoot um, that's a pretty f uh, familiarized term and and uh, commonly used term I personally think that it's incorrect to call it that um, I don't shoot a move mount shoot style I like to kind of like requalify it as move and mount then shoot uh, because I'm wanting my movement and my body and my hands to happen and start at the same time and both prolong from start to finish of the shot where as soon as the target starts to move I start to move in my rotation and my hands keeping the gun perfectly in line with the bird so the point of impact is on the line of the target from start to finish of my move my mount starts when the target starts and finishes when I pull the trigger so theoretically 99% of the whole shot that I'm taking is out of the gun and the moment that I finish the mount is the moment that I pull the trigger. If that is the case, then I do not use soft focus. That, that approach to visual focus is not in my vocabulary for my teaching um, because it is uh, detrimental to the process at which I'm trying to execute. The other style of shooting, it would be something like, uh, you could classify it as any type of mechanics or technique uh, that have the word insertion in the explanation of the mechanics. So if any coaches ever use the word insertion point, then that would be a style of shooting that would require a soft focus and then a hard focus. Here is the explanation for why. Um, I'm just checking the comments real quick. Okay. And then we have to, to understand the explanation of why that is the case. We need to understand neurologically how the eyes work. There are two different styles of ocular muscular movement. Um, I butchered the medical explanation of that, but I'm not a doctor. Um, the one style of movement in your eyes is called smooth pursuit and the other style of movement in your eyes is called uh, psychotic movement. So we have smooth pursuit movement and psychotic movement. Smooth pursuit movement is um, both of those types of movement are controlled by different neurological circuitry in the brain. Um, it literally is a different, it's a, in plain terms, it's a different, uh, your brain is sending signals on two different roads for each style of movement. So if I'm using smooth pursuit movement, I'm taking one highway to, con to send the signals to control my ocular muscles. If I'm using psychotic movement in my eyes, I'm taking a different highway to control the, the ocular muscles in my eyes. Uh, so two different circuits, one muscle very interesting. What determines which one of those circuits is being used is the intensity of conscious attention on a specific thing in your vision. So it is neurologically impossible to engage in smooth pursuit movement of your eyes if you do not have something moving in your vision for you to consciously focus on. Um, so if, and the way that I can, exp a really good example of this, I'm gonna use two examples. The way I can explain it is that you guys can all see my eyes. Okay, um, I'm going to start, uh, my eyes on, yeah, my fingers are right there, okay. So if you're looking at my eyes, I'm going to start looking at this finger, I'm going to try to look at this finger and move my eyes very smoothly from, the, from my left finger, which looks like it's on the right side of your screen, to my right finger. Okay, so this would be psychotic movement. Okay, so if you were able to see that, I'll do it again. 
it's not possible to make my eyes move smoothly. If you're watching the video, my eyes are jumping. It's like little tiny jumps as I go from one finger to the other finger because there's nothing in between each finger that's moving for me to consciously pay attention to and synchronize the, the movement of my ocular muscle with that thing. If I want to engage smooth pursuit movement, I have to have something in my vision that's moving that I'm deciding to pay attention to um, or I have to have something in my vision that is not moving where my head is moving and my eyes will stay locked onto it and I'm consciously paying attention to that thing. Here is an example of smooth pursuit movement. I cannot do this holding both fingers up. I have to do this um, uh, because I'm going to need a finger or something to look at. So I'm going to say that I will use one finger and I'm going to start from one side of the screen and go to the other side of the screen with my eyes. So watch my eyes on this one. Let me get that in the right position. Okay, here we go. Okay, so if you saw that, you can see that my eyes are moving very smooth left to right and right to left. That's smooth pursuit. You guys can all try this at home. You can feel the difference and you'll be able to feel how impossible it is to move using smooth pursuit uh, vision if there's nothing moving. Um, so because of the, ne the scientific neurological definition of what smooth pursuit vision is, which is that it requires conscious attention and focus I, let me say that with emphasis, conscious attention and focus, not visual focus, conscious focus. You are consciously dedicating a portion of your attention to this specific thing. Because of the fact that it requires that, we cannot also consciously pay attention to something else in our vision and have a fully engaged level of smooth pursuit movement in our eyes. In order to connect to a target with the gun proprioceptively, which is in a three-dimensional sense that is not two-dimensionally conscious, which means that if I'm proprioceptively connecting to the target with my gun, then I'm looking at the gun and my brain is non-consciously and non uh, and it, my brain is non-consciously placing the point of impact in the correct position to break the bird as it progresses through the air without me consciously deciding where it is and consciously driving the gun. It happens non-consciously. Proprioceptive shooting is better than good mechanics every day because a person that shoots with bad mechanics but trusts every shot they take will beat somebody with perfect mechanics that doesn't trust every, any shot they take every single day. This is why we can debate all day long which mechanical approach to shooting is better, but it's impossible to prove that because no human being has been able to uh, dominate in a level to which they just never lose that would prove that their mechanics are better because on a day that I may have you know, executed my mechanics perfectly and I may believe hopefully that my mechanics are better than any other coach out there or any other shooter out there um, I may not trust the shots I'm taking you may have somebody who doesn't have good mechanics that is super free very present very confident and able to pull the trigger at the perfect moment when they're looking at the bird perfectly every time and they'll beat me all day every day so um, uh, because of the understanding of that. That is not a personal opinion. That what I just said all there is science. So you can't we can't argue that. Um, and the uh, because that's science and that's the way that your eyes work and if they don't work that way, you may have a, a TBI or um, some other type of neurological circuitry issue. But if, um, if, if that is fact, then that means that if I use soft focus in my shooting and I shoot a very proprioceptive style of shooting where I do not have an insertion point in my mechanics, then I'm giving up conscious attention on the target by passively looking at the target using soft focus and not synchronizing my eyes with the bird using smooth pursuit vision until a specific point in the line of the bird 
which means that I am compressing the amount of time that I have to proprioceptively engage with the target to a period of time of the line that is small and very close to the breakpoint, which will give me emotional feedback and a feeling of uh, of like being rushed to take the shot. That in itself increases anxiety, will ca cause cautiousness, carefulness, and probably force me to aim uh, unintendedly. So if I have an insertion point in my mechanics, by definition of what an insertion point is, you're consciously deciding a space to put, to put the gun in front of the target somewhere in the middle of the line. If you use that in your definitions of your mechanics, you cannot say logically that you use a hard focus from start to finish because if you use a hard focus on the target from the beginning of the shot, then you have to disengage that hard focus so that you can pay attention to where the gun goes and that engages more of a passive psychotic movement of your eyes and then you would have to re-engage hard focus. The problem with that is, is that putting your brain through the process of engaging conscious attention on the target takes time. So to do that twice during the shot, again, doesn't work. So if you use that style of shooting, then you have to use soft focus so that you can you can create a conscious insertion point and then flip the shot into being into using smooth pursuit vision and being more proprioceptive at the end of the shot which is where all of those shooting mechanics and styles talk about uh you know they like they'll push off the target and they just kind of let their hands feel the shot out and they don't know what the lead is that's their poor explanation of of uh of shooting proprioceptively um and i don't mean that with insult i just mean it that you know i'm a shooting coach i'm not a doctor or a neurologist or an ophthalmologist so i have to use shooting words to describe things because i don't have the education and background of something else um but uh if i try to use soft focus on the shot then like I said, I'm not going to allow myself to create that connection that's required for me to have the gun in the right spot without it being in my face and being able to consciously see where it is. So I personally try to use hard focus from the very beginning, whereas somebody like Anthony would, would want to use a soft focus in the beginning and switch to a hard focus. Let me explain one last thing using an, using an example that will help you understand why this is required to be this way and why both Anthony, someone like Anthony and someone like myself are both correct because we're talking about this through the filter of our own different mechanics. If you were to take a, a ceiling fan in your house and put two dots on, uh, on, um, uh, uh, two blades that are next to each other two different colored dots let's say like a yellow and a purple one and then you turn the fan on like a medium speed to where it's slow enough to where if you do it right you can synchronize your eyes and you can slow it down to where you see one blade so don't get it so fast that that's impossible but then also just fast enough to where if you're passively looking i.e. soft focus that it looks like a blur of a of like a plane propeller. Put it on at that speed, get underneath it, and with those two dots on there, and try to find one of the dots. You will notice that it is not a binary transition from a full blur to an individual blade. What you will notice is that it will be a uh, a, a, a transition in a spectrum of the blades looking like they're slowing down and then all of a sudden boom it locks into one single blade if you notice that the blade that you locked in on is not the one is not one of the blades with the dots and then you immediately try to think about finding another one the blades will speed up again um, and and keep doing that until you find the blade that you have a dot on 
Once you do that, hold that as long as you can or even just a millisecond. And at that moment, I want you to, to, to consciously try to pay attention to both dots, one on each blade. You will notice that the speed that the blades look like they are spinning speeds up and then you lose your synchronous smooth pursuit connection with the fan. That's because you split the partition of your RAM memory, so to speak, in your consciousness, like in your conscious attention and focus, and that subtly influenced the circuitry of what's controlling your eyes, and you could no longer move your eyes in the muscular way that's required to have that connection with that fan blade. You will also notice a big difference in the way that your eyes feel when they move in those two different ways. So um, I think that's one of the coolest things about how the eyes work and it's really neat to understand that difference so that you understand why it's required differently in each mechanic and why, um, why very uh, um, heavily sought after coaches but have contrasting opinions that they will go to the grave um, uh, believing because they're both right um, but if you try to do a hard focus like I do using the different mechanics it will be disastrous and if you try to do soft focus using my mechanics it will be disastrous so I hope that answered your question and um, I know that I went really in depth with that and it's not really focused on um, learning how to plan a practice, but that's a really, really good question. Um, and I feel like that's valuable information for all of you guys listening because of the fact that I know that a lot of you here are not my students and they're not, and, and you, you know, you may never be able to be my student because you don't live in the area or you can't afford to travel. And, and uh, you may decide that you want to maintain your style of shooting, um, but work with me through this podcast and helping to accomplish your own goals. So you would need to know that going forward. Um, so that's why I went into detail. Um, and you guys, that was actually really cool to be able to answer that question. So you have any questions? Does anybody have any questions on that specific or particular thing? Um, did I lose any of you in that explanation or anything like that? I'll give you a few seconds. I'll read the comments while we go. Let's see. Of course, Craig, no problem. Thanks for asking the question. It was a great question. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. That's um, some cool, important stuff. Jason, I don't want to hear any of your rules. <laughs> What's the rule? Let's hear it. Come on, what do we got? so many questions I have to book a call oh man Hoss I hope you've been well it's good to hear from you thanks for being here um, and I hope the house is good I uh, hope you're enjoying it and you have a house you know that's uh, that's made for you that's pretty awesome I'm not allowed to use words with more than four syllables. I don't think I did. Proprio, Seth. Proprio. Yeah, I did. That's the biggest word I used, I think. So that's not that bad. Um, okay. I don't think there's any more questions on that. Um, so, oh, I'm getting some more. Awesome. Good to hear. Okay, so uh, I'll go back into the practice stuff. So I, 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 I basically what I was talking about was, you know, I'll summarize. You do the shoot analysis. You get the categories that are your weakest links. You take those categories and you, and you try to theorize a way 
to build a routine that you're going to use in practice to highlight those mechanics, to force you to work on them or to force you to learn more about them so that your knowledge and experience in those things that were your lowest hanging fruit that that shoot analysis sheet told you about um, increases. You wanna build your knowledge, build your experience and build your confidence in those things and those things don't always have to be physical mechanics. Um, yeah, Nate, it is my favorite word. Um, okay, so now we, I, 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 the one thing I want to touch on is the, uh, the mental approach, just your personal, uh, emotional and mental and um, uh, uh, approach to practice and what your expectations should be and what your goal for practicing should be. Um, there's a, there's a lot to unpack here, and um, I, I don't want to lose people in, I, I don't want to talk about very important stuff so far into a video podcast or when this gets released uh, tomorrow or tonight in an audio version. Um, you know, this is going to be important stuff, so uh, I'm going to, I'll get into depth with it, but... Uh, if you guys have questions for any of it in the middle of what I'm talking about, just interrupt me with a question. And um, I talk about this stuff. This is my job to know these things. I'm not reading notes. I'm just talking off my head. So it, it, I don't. I'm not going to get interrupted and, and lose my train of thought or anything. Uh, so please feel free. I want to make sure that I communicate this well and uh, in my other recorded episodes because of my ADHD and, and how my brain works and how I get off in tangents I have notes in front of me um, and I follow a very strict thing and I and I record snippets at a time that way they're easier to digest for you guys on these live podcasts I don't have the ability to do that so I recognize that it can be hard to follow so so please um, feel free to uh, to just interrupt um, okay so the mindset of practicing. One thing that we all have to be able to do is give up our the value that we place in breaking a target because it, in practice. <laughs> um, honestly, in a tournament too, uh, as long as you're doing it for the right reason, but in practice, the goal of practice the goal of most practices is not to hit as many targets as possible. Every day, I mean, I teach every day, and every day I, I have an average of two students. The normal amount of time people book with me is about four hours. So, you know, on a, on a busy day, I get four people. On a medium day, I get three. So it's not too many, but um, uh, every day, because if, if I'm saying every day I have this question, that actually means a lot because that's roughly around, you know, 50 to, um, you know, 33 percent of the students that I have are asking me this question, you know, um, uh, you know, the, or framing to me this point that they are get, you know, they, how do I practice in a way that doesn't have me missing targets or you know, I, I don't understand how, you know, when you're trying to control where, uh, I'm going to say it this way and it might get confusing, but I, I mean it specifically. When I'm trying to c control where they are thinking, um, if I can get it to the place that, that I want, it tends to negatively influence their break percentage for a little bit. And why is it that in a lesson when they're missing sometimes that I get excited and I and tell them that's the best one I saw or whatever it is uh, until that slowly transitions and then they hit it. The reason for that is because um, the very goal of if you're practicing, if your goal is to um, hit the bird, you completely distract your conscious thought from what where it should be, which is being interceptively paying attention to the way that your body feels, to the emotions that you're experiencing, 
to the way that your eyes are working um, when you're trying to do the thing that you're trying to do. A, a, a great, just very recent example of that in this podcast would be when I did the little demonstration about the two different ways that our eyes work. Okay, if on a day-to-day -day basis, all of you are moving your eyes so much, you never really think about the way it feels. But if you do that demonstration for yourself, like literally right now as you're li listening to this, put your finger in front of you and trace your finger back and forth as it moves with your eyes. Pay attention to it and synchronize your eye movement with your finger and literally pay attention to the way that your eyes feel when they move. You will feel the smoothness of that movement. Now do the same thing and put both fingers and two fingers in front of you and move from one finger to the next. Look at one finger, then look at the other finger and feel the difference in the way that your eyes move there. That's something that goes, uh, that, that we gloss over and don't really experience or pay attention to and feel when we're practicing or when we sh we're shooting because our conscious attention is on the bird. We want to hit the bird. But if you're trying to practice visual mechanics and you're trying to practice engaging smooth pursuit vision on a target as good as possible, how, how are you going to be able to do that if you're so consciously wrapped up in hitting the bird that that's the only thing that you're paying attention to? Um, the, uh, likewise, if you're trying to practice a physical mechanic of literally just being able to, to execute a full shot or pair from start to finish, maintaining the same balance and not creating tension, but the whole shot you're super aware and paying attention to and focused on breaking the bird, you won't feel the balance change in your body. Um, this is all basically where we're placing value in what we're doing. It's a difference in, in a predetermined plan with a specific value and goal and process versus being on autopilot when we're shooting and even if we have the same process and goal. It's very easy to say, I wanna go practice shooting crossing targets. And then we go and shoot and practice and we shoot 500 crossing targets and you know we feel good about the fact that we shot 495 broken birds out of 500 and that increases our confidence that's that's a totally valid form of practice you're practicing quantity consistency you're building your confidence that's a whole nother variable but that's not the only kind of practice another type of practice is learning physical movement and skills and the only way to do that is to realign what you're trying to pay attention to. Um, uh, I'm going to pause really quick because I keep seeing the chat move and I'm gonna read this real quick. So Jason DeLester is wanting to know, does medication for ADHD help shooters? My good friend started a medication and got worse. Not sure if the meds or his divorce. <laughs> I did not mean to laugh for that. I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, the, uh, uh, but actually, uh, I would guarantee you that it's the medication that negatively influenced him. Um, uh, yeah, and great comments by Nathan Curtis. Uh, but Jason, um, ADHD medication. Oh boy, I'm gonna get on from another tangent. I already know. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to, but I'm gonna. It's gonna be hard to resist myself. Short summary, people who have ADHD have a problem with the production of dopamine in their brain. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's hugely, that hugely influences the, the data sent back and forth from the eyes and the visual cortex of the brain. And then it, it influences how many, uh, here's a way, here's an analogy, think of frames per second in a video. Right now, I'm streaming this at 1080p and 30 FPS, 30 frames per second. Um, if I put it and was streaming it at um, 1080p and 60 frames per second, the video would look smoother to you. Um, if I brought it down to 1080p and 15 frames per second, as I move like this, my hand's gonna look choppy, okay? The difference between digital video and the way that your brain processes the information that's sent to it from your eyes is that in the video that you watch 
you literally see frame, then frame, then frame. And so you see choppiness. Your brain will not decode visual information from your eyes to show you the same way that it does on a computer screen that gets choppy. And um, what happens is it still makes it look equally as smooth. It just looks much less detailed and way faster because your brain has to fill in the same amount of time, 15 frames per second or 60 frames per second. So it has to fill in that one second amount of time with either less pictures or frames or more pictures and frames. If it has more pictures, frames, then what happens is the, it gives you an overload of data and it looks really, really slow. A good analogy of that would be put your, your camera in slow motion and it's filming in 240 frames per second. So it shoves 240 frames into one second of video and then it stretches it out and shows it to you maybe in 60 frames per second so that it makes it all look very slow. Um, the kind of, in a way, the eyes work the same way. Dopamine is a huge neurotransmitter that influences that along with adrenaline and oxygen. So if you have the right amount of adrenaline, oxygen, and dopamine, then you see with incredible detail and incredibly slow. If, uh, if your dopamine goes down um, or, it, or you just play around with it, then you will influence the quality of vision that you have um, as well as a couple other things, the way that you perceive time and, and some stuff like that. With somebody who has ADHD, their normal daily dopamine production is very, very low. You give them an ADHD medication and it influences the release and the receptors of dopamine. And so their perception of their vision will be changed. Um, and actually the, the neurochemical way that their eyes are working is changed. Also, it can influence things like heart rate um, breathing patterns and stuff like that and so basically ADHD medication screws your vision for what you would want to use it for in shooting but if you're not shooting you never really notice the difference um, and uh, and so a normal daily day-to-day -day basis ADHD medication is great for somebody with ADHD uh, to accomplish normal daily tasks Unfortunately for shooting, it will really help you stay focused, but if you're in tune with your eyes or you've learned to shoot without the medication and the timing and synchronization and reaction time that you have intuitively built into your response to shooting um, is, is based off of non-medication. If you start the medication, it throws it all off. Um, so uh, I tend... I, like, I do not shoot with medication, it's, I, I'm terrible. To give you an example of how bad it influences, I probably, uh, I mean, the way I shoot really presses how well I use my eyes. I really force them and use them at the, the, the absolute limits of zero margin of error. And uh, so it's gonna hurt me worse than somebody who's holding onto a shot and shooting later. But I, on a course I'd shoot a 95 on without the medication. If I had the medication, I'd probably shoot a 75. Um, so huge difference. Um, yeah, Hank's, Hank's saying, shooting in the first half of my ADHD medication is great. The second half is a dumpster fire. That's very, very true. Um, uh, early on with the medication, um, it's it's actually really good. The reasoning for that, I do not have scientific evidence for this. I just have uh, experiential data. But the reasoning for that is because the the dopamine release and stuff that it's playing with helps you to focus. And somebody with ADHD has a hard time focusing. But if you're on that medication for you know prolonged throughout the day, because it changes your um, some other stuff and kind of gets you a little bit more amped and excited and and stuff like that um uh i've noticed that uh, i try to be very self-aware i've noticed that my breathing pattern and rate changes i breathe more shallow and and quickly so i'm not oxygenating my blood very well 
at the end of the day if I it's probably my VO2 max is a little bit lower and so that combined with the dopamine if I have low oxygen it's going to influence my eyes really really bad whereas early on you know if I take that medication right when I go to start a round that hasn't really uh, that really hasn't taken effect yet so I get the helpfulness of the attention to the dopamine uh, or from the dopamine but I'm not getting the negative side effects of the changed breathing rate and stuff like that um, okay yeah of, thank you for asking that question is a good question um, doesn't apply to some of us but it does for others so going back to the practice stuff um, I want to put a huge emphasis on the importance of making it uh, uh, on the importance of communicating to you guys that uh, when you let me think about a way to explain this <laughs> Curtis um, because the suggested homework after this episode is going to be to use a shoot analysis sheet that you've already turned in or do a shoot analysis sheet on your most recent tournament or do a shoot analysis sheet on a practice that you use to simulate a tournament um, because that is the suggested homework and uh, and then to to use the data that that shoot analysis sheet emails you to come up with a creative practice routine based off of what it's telling you to practice on every single one of you or a lot of you are going to have a different plan for your practice it's your some of you are going to have practices that are very heavily based on the physical mechanics some of you are going to have practices that are very heavily based in working on your pre-shot routine some of you will have practices that will very heavily be based in the visual mechanics or being very present minded, whatever. You're going to, uh, some of you, you know, like all these different categories. You could have practices where you're like, man, I'm really struggling in my research phase. How can I come up with a practice routine or a practice drill that makes me better at researching information? Um, that kind of stuff you're all gonna have different things so I can't talk about this individually so I'm gonna have to talk about it generally whatever it is that you come up with as your goal for the practice make that your where your value is in your in your shooting so if you if you do your shooting uh, your shoot analysis sheet and it comes back saying that you have to get you know you're wanting to you, you're missing 80 percent of the points available to you in your research phase and uh, all across the board and all those things and you come up with a practice plan and drill to build a, a b better skill set in researching information um, then don't grade yourself on whether or not you're hitting targets. Grade yourself on the success of your practice on whether or not you're getting more and valuable information when you're trying to find it on the research phase. Feel good about going and, and doing that type of practice if you are like, man, I am, I am like getting I'm, I'm noticing so much more about the target line and I'm so much more aware about the way that when I try to rehearse what my what my plan is in my body I'm getting so much feedback about how these mechanics are going to leave my balance at the end of the first shot and how hard it is to move to the second shot and those are things I would never pay attention to before you should feel proud if that's the kind of stuff that you're pulling from a practice plan that's based in that. You should not be discouraged if you missed because in the shot, I would want you to be focusing on what you're feeling, not what you're seeing. And if we go back to the question that Craig asked about um, hard focus versus soft focus and where I talked about the difference between uh, smooth pursuit vision and saccadic vision 
then if you're consciously paying attention to the way that your body feels in the shot, you won't be able to fully consciously pay attention to seeing the bird. And that's gonna detract from your ability to hit the bird because it's gonna detract from your ability to connect to the bird proprioceptively. And that's okay. And that's one of the biggest things that we need to accept about practice is that practice is not trying to accomplish all of the different variables and making uh, that are required to shoot a good score and making them all better in one practice. It doesn't help you that much to go and just shoot and try to do everything at one time. When I, when I try to teach my students how to practice better, I try to teach them to say, look, if you're not using a shoot analysis sheet, just pick a variable that you think you're not that good at right now. And that could be in, you know, be getting very refined into the phys physical mechanics and saying like, I really need to practice the hand speed in my mount. Okay, your goal will be to go and, and consciously be focused on how the speed of your hands feel as you're mounting uh, the gun into the shot of every shot that you take. If you're doing that, you're gonna be consciously paying attention to the way your hands feel, not consciously looking at the bird that well. So you're probably gonna miss more than you would if you were not paying attention to the way your hands feel. But you won't be learning very much if, if you're not paying attention to your hands. What you'll be doing is just being uh, is will just be shooting on autopilot like you would in a tournament and we don't get better we don't learn new physical skill and we don't refine physical skill while we're shooting in a tournament tournaments are the sole goal of connecting visually to the bird to execute whatever it is that you have in terms of your mechanical ability in that moment intuitively and subconsciously we when I go to a tournament, I do not care how good my mechanics are. I'm doing everything I can to hit the bird. I don't want to get conscious in my movement. I want to be conscious on seeing the target. So unpack the variables. Break down your shooting into, you know, whatever mechanical style of shooting that you, that you use um, is. Whatever one, you know, whatever the way you filter the game of sporting plays into or whatever shooting game you're you're doing go on get a piece of paper out and write down all the things all the physical movements that are required to do those mechanics if you shoot a pull away method one of the very individualistic mechanics is the very last movement in your hands to push off the target or to push off of your insertion point you could have a practice routine solely focused on making that a more refined and controlled movement. Um, you could make an ins getting working on insertion points it, a whole separate practice where the only thing you care about is having good insertion points and executing them good and also maybe uh, maybe work on um, you know a way to determine a, the best insertion points. Um, if you could have a practice solely based in getting better at starting your movement when the bird starts rather than delaying your movement uh, and, and losing synchronization at the beginning of the shot. All of those things, that's, that's how you make a practice routine. Um, if you want to get, you know, this is where I'm going to play the card of I don't want to tell you how to come up with a practice routine to do any of those things yet because I want that to be your suggested homework I want you to be able to say you know how can I get better at start time what would be a drill that I could come up with or invent that would challenge my ability to um, to uh, to do that correctly but would also make me very conscious of that as I'm trying to shoot it. So that's the important thing that we have to understand about what practice really is. Practice is becoming very conscious of the physical movement that we're trying to do or uh, becoming very conscious of the emotional state that we're trying to learn to control or shoot within or becoming very conscious of the visual movement that we're trying to do. Uh, it, it, practice is 
high levels of conscious awareness revolving around the specific goal of that practice. So once you determine what the goal is to practice, once you determine what the what the uh, skill set or variable is that you want to get better in, then your goal for that practice will be to design something that makes you consciously aware of that thing, but also challenges your ability to be able to do it well. So that way it's not possible to do it perfect every time because the way that you will learn to get better is to be able is to be uh, engrossed in the process of either not doing it correctly or doing it correctly and then after every attempt uh, going back and and reliving that attempt to grade yourself on how well the attempt worked not the result but how well that very specific thing that you're trying to do happened we do not care if the target broke. We care about if you started in, excuse me, we care about if you started in time, if your goal for the practice is to get better at start time. We don't care if you hit the target. We care if you established visual smooth pursuit movement at the moment that you planned, if your goal was to have a practice to get better at not passively seeing birds. We don't care if you hit the target, if your goal was to have good, have a good speed in your hands, in your mount, that perfectly synchronized with the vertical speed of the bird. Um, we would just care if that thing happened. Because if you're being consciously aware of that thing, you're going to make it harder to hit the bird. And if you try to hit the bird, you're going to not be consciously aware of that thing, and then what is going to happen is you're going to you're going to mix up the difference between uh, an open feedback uh, an, an open loop and closed loop learning process shooting unfortunately has an external result to the process that you're trying to do uh, to the process that you're trying to learn and that's the thing that is so heavily and humanistically ingrained in us in terms of uh, to be looked at as the most important thing. So if I shoot and I hit the target, I, I have intuitively learned over the whole course of my life that I did it right. But I could have done it wrong and hit the target. And so the way that the brain learns a physical skill better is it catalogs your dopamine release based off of what you believe, uh, based off of where your value lies and what you're doing and what the result was. So if you care about hitting the target and, and that's what your goal is, then every time you try to execute something that you're trying to practice, whether or not you did that thing correctly, if you hit the target, your brain will say, that was a good one, let's save that one for later, and then it's, it will catalog that and save it for later. If you miss it, the brain will say, that was a bad one, uh, we're gonna delete that. Well, what happens if the one that you missed was the perfect physical movement that you were trying to execute. And the one that you hit was horrendous, <laughs> but you hit it because the only thing you cared about was seeing the target. Well, we already know that that's the status quo of what's intuitively subconscious for you. We're trying to change that from being the intuitive subconscious thing that happens when you don't think about what you're doing. So the only way to change that is to think about what you're doing. And so we've made no progress if we care about the result of the shot. We make progress if we care about the process of the shot, specifically assigning that value to the thing that we're, that we're trying to work on. So um, there is a fantastic podcast by one of my favorite um, public uh, doctors basically um, that talks so much about 
um, your eye, the, the eyes and the brain. His name is Dr. Andrew Huberman, and he has a podcast called Huberman Lab. Um, and it's quite possibly like, if you like this kind of stuff, it's quite possibly the most valuable resource for learning so many different things about the way that your brain works and the chemistry of it and the way that your eyes work. Um, and I have learned a lot from this guy. Um, he is a, a, a research and teaching professor at Stanford with uh, degrees in ophthalmology and neurobiology. Um, and the one specific podcast that I would recommend all of you listen to, I'm probably going to get the name, the title of it wrong because I don't think he does it by episode numbers, but it's the Huberman Lab podcast and the episode title is called something like How to Learn a Physical Skill Faster. And he will, he goes in there and he talks to you about you know, the way that the brain learns physical movement and skill proprioceptively. And w one specific example that he, I think I might have talked about this in the last podcast I released, but anyways, he uses a specific example of like, it is literally, a, uh, you should look at it being a more successful day if you had a thousand attempts at doing this thing that you're trying to learn and 997 of them did not work but three of them resulted in you having an aha moment where it was so vividly different than those other 997 that you had a big enough dopamine spike that that would be something that you really seriously remember. And after that round or after that practice, if you go back and, re and relive that uh, shot or specific movement, backwards through visualization. I know that sounds weird, but it, there's scientific evidence to show that. Um, if you relive that backwards and then go to sleep, basically you'll delete the 997 and you'll maintain the three. The next time you go out, it'll be six and 994. And then the next time you go out, it'll be 12 good ones and then 24 good ones and then 48. And that's how you learn physical skills faster. But it's so, so, so important. I have to stress so much that we care about the specific thing that we've picked to determine to practice. Um, and uh, the, okay, let me put a pause on that because that was another tangent. And, um, and, it's, and we are getting uh, about to the three hour mark. So I wanna, I wanna open it up for any questions on what I just said there. Uh, because after this, what I think I'm going to do is probably uh, probably go into just one short, one more short thing, and um, and then we'll probably call it. I'm going to. read the uh, comments thank you guys for all staying with me on this um, it's definitely late and um, the, I've never done a podcast like this before where I'm trying to teach but also maintain some some level of feeling like a real classroom uh, this is very fun to me also challenging so I'm not I've never done it before I'm not very good at it uh, and um, thank you guys for hanging in there and and, uh, and helping me with it okay as I give you guys like maybe one or two minutes to um, to come up with some questions if you have any uh, I will be right back. I'm going to get another water. Cool. I will keep paying attention to this.
Okay, we're back. Um, I'm talking so much, I'm running out of water bottles. Uh, okay, actually some really good questions as I went to go get some. Uh, um, I, but I, I want one clarification. Uh, Nate, could you rephrase your question where you said no opportunities to practice informally and then you said, or should I say purposefully? Um, I know that you meant to replace informally with purposefully, but I, I, is that a question, or is that was were you just saying that you don't have opportunity to do that? Um, and then Ron, uh, oh, I, uh, Nate, I found your other question. How can I turn a round of five sand into a practice session? Um, answer this question for me. Do you mean like in a five stand league where like there's other people and you can't modify the menu or stay in one location and shoot different th shoot the same target over and over again so uh, because I would have two different answers for you if, if you were able to be at the five stand alone and do whatever you wanted I would have one answer if you're saying that you would have to be at the five stand with four other people and go through the order of everything I would have another answer for you Ron had a question he says do you think it would be a good idea to do practice with no shells? Go through the motion without the thought of breaking the target. 100% uh, absolutely. That is a, a whole, that's a whole realm of practice that is incredibly important. I use that, um, I use that uh, approach to stuff when, um, I use that approach to getting a student uh, to get to let me let my mind uh, slow down so my mouth can catch up. <laughs> Woo. Okay. Um, I use the approach of, of having students fully go through the process of shooting with pulling the trigger included with no shells when I am struggling to get them to reframe what they're valuing about what they're doing and I have them do that so that it is impossible for them to care about breaking the bird because it's not possible to break the target if there are no shells so it fully brings them into the present moment pulls them into being very introceptively aware of their body uh, and, and makes them much more consciously uh, aware of feeling the physical movements that are happening as they're trying to execute the specific mechanic that we're working on. Um, I do, like I said, I do that in lessons a lot with people in, sh in short moments of time. You know, maybe at the most I've ever done in a lesson is, you know, 20 shots. I, I you know, I know in some of the lessons I've had with you, we've done that for a prolonged period of time. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, and with uh, and with Jason, um, but I would say that I personally do that as a practice routine, uh, probably twice a year. And um, to give you an example of the percentage of how much of my practice is that, I would say that I feel very safe in saying that I shoot probably, I'm not saying this to make it sound like I, I'm good and I don't practice that much. It's just uh, I, a good form of practice for me is teaching because it, it, it makes me so aware of like what can go wrong and it really increases my ability to strategize and choice making that I have. So because I teach every day, that supplements a lot of practice. I also can work on visual mechanics and stuff like that. But as far as actually being behind the gun and shooting in practice, um, I would say that I probably shoot no more than 4,000 rounds a year in practice. Um, and I think, honestly, that may be stretching it. Uh, I would say I shoot anywhere between two to four thousand rounds of shots of practice with my gun every year. Um, not when I was younger. I would say it's been this way for about 
three to about three to five years with the exception of the one year that I lived in Florida in like 2019. Uh, so let's max it out and say that I shoot 4,000 targets a year. I practice without shells. I do that at least twice a year. Uh, probably not at least. I do that twice a year. Um, and when I do that, each time that I do that, I would say I probably shoot anywhere from 250 to 350 targets like that. So let's take the highest number of targets I actually shoot and the lowest number of targets that I pull the trigger on with no shells. So that means I'm shooting 4,000 targets and I'm dry firing 500 targets. So um, that's a considerable percentage of my overall practice is, is that. And you know, I don't know if that would scale, you know, if somebody shoots 20,000 rounds of practice if they would want to do the equivalent percentage in dry firing I don't think it can hurt I can tell you it's pretty dang cheap <laughs> um, but uh, it's a fantastic way of practicing because it turns shooting into um, into forcing you to psychologically filter what you're doing through valuing the result of your movement or specific mechanic that you're working on and not the result of the shot. So uh, it's very, very good. Very, very good practice. Um, okay, no opportunity to be alone and do it my way. Okay, so Nate, I would say that um, it would depend on what your shoot analysis sheet would say. Um, why don't we do this? Because in, in the next YouTube Live episode, uh, because I should be at home and I have uh, the office and the huge setup that I have there with multiple monitors and I can pull people in on episodes, um, I feel like the question that you just asked is going to be applicable for a lot of people and so it would be valuable to use you um, uh, a little bit as an example so other people can learn from that. So why don't we do this? Um, if you have an opportunity to fill out a shoot analysis sheet or, or if you already have, I'll look and see if you have because um, it's all automated and I don't know off the top of my head, but if you can fill in a shoot analysis sheet out within the next, um, I would say before, not this coming Monday, but before the next Monday, I don't know what the date of that would be. It would be uh, It would be the 1st of February. So if you can fill out that sheet by the 1st of February, then what I will do is I will go through with you. I will use you as one of the people uh, to walk you through building a practice plan based off of your shoot analysis sheet and what you can use in practice. Uh, because that'd be, oh boy, I just lost my computer screen. I hope you guys are all still there. This is not good. Hello. Okay, now we're back. Now we're gone again. What is happening? Okay, I'm reading the I'm reading the comments, and you're saying that I'm that you guys are still seeing me. I can't see my computer screen anymore, so um, I'll just go for it. I'll I'll try to pay attention more to my phone uh, to see the comments of, of everything. Um, I'm under attack. YouTube's kicking me off. I'm talking. I'm using too many uh, four-plus-syllable words, Jason. <laughs> um, 
gosh dang I really do have the little uh, chat bot gump coming in uh, okay so yeah I know Chris I gotta oh I can block them I didn't know that I could do that Unfortunately, I can't, um, I could block them on my computer, uh, but not on my uh, phone because uh, I'm logged into two different accounts. Um, okay, uh, was there another question that I missed? Let me see. Uh, Brandon is saying if you're going to practice and not care about outcome then how do you measure progress on what you are working for instance if you're working on a specific movement how do you measure progress um, it seems like measuring an improvement on feel is very subjective that's a really that's a very good and a very fair question Brandon and um, actually I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, that's bad uh, that's uh, shame on me for not uh, communicating that <laughs> the uh, that's awesome I'm I uh, if I could if I could hire you and if I if I was if I was making money on this I'd hire you to help me <laughs> the uh, okay so the 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 way that you measure progress on that is uh, it, it is subjective based off of feel but it's all built into what you what what and how you plan what your what your practice plan is so um, you know if you're uh, you I can answer it that way but there's also some other training tools that you can use to help you um, so let's say that you um, you're trying to practice visual mechanics and we'll just say very simply so I can make the explanation short that you're trying to learn to engage smooth pursuit vision earlier hold it longer uh, you know blah 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 um, the uh, how you would measure whether or not you were doing it right would require you to have a level of self-awareness to be able to assess what happened after the shot and you would have to be able to take a shot and uh, and analyze the visual information that you got during the shot and compare and contrast from one shot to the next so for example if you're saying okay I want I'm working on smooth pursuit movement um, and then before you go to take the shot on the specific target that you're working on uh, s rehearse the movement with no gun and and work it into a place where uh, watching show pair after show pair or show bird after show bird until you feel like you have you found a way to see it for as long and as good and as smooth as possible and you've engaged smooth pursuit vision and not psychotic movement in your eyes um, for as long as possible and pay attention to the level of detail that that allows you to see on the bird also pay attention to the slowness that that makes the bird uh, that that uh, that was horrendously set up English and for the sentence. Um, pay attention to how slow that that style of visual connection with the bird makes it look. Pay attention to um, the moment in time when the bird is flying through the air and looks like it hits thicker air and slows down really fast um, because that's the moment that you went from psychotic to engaging smooth pursuit. And you want to pay attention to all those things. You'll pay attention to also to the amount of time that you perceive that the whole shot takes. That's without a gun. Then when you go shoot, you take a shot and you compare it against that pair, uh, against the view bird. And you say, okay, did, was that more or less de uh, visual detail? Did it look like it was faster or did it look like it was slower? Did I feel like I had more time or did I feel like I had less time? And you're comparing and contrasting all the things that getting better at that specific mechanic that you're trying to work on uh, feel like and, uh, and all of the things that you perceive to happen differently when it's good or bad. And they're all very simple things because everything that you'd be trying to do would make the shot better. And so 
if you're just defining what you're doing by better, then that means very simply, you know, if it's a physical thing, more control, uh, more precise movement, um, uh, better balance, slower, smoother, calmer, more detail, more time, um, uh, more efficient, uh, less anxiety, less tension, um, less confusion, less searching, more exact places with the eyes and the body as opposed to, you know, squirrely movement all over the place. So you're going to just be comparing and contrasting and along, along the journey of doing that compare and contrast analysis from shot to shot to shot, what you'll be doing is additionally practicing increasing your level of self-awareness. That itself is a specific skill that becomes very useful when you pull that in to a post shot analysis that you would use in a tournament because if you get very good through the practice of this skill if you get very good at being able to know what just happened in the shot and know how you ex experienced it and know what it felt like and know what it looked like if you become very good at being able to do that then if you miss in a tournament and you can do that for yourself then you can say the w it felt the same in every way that it should have based off of how I planned it to be except for this one little area and that little area was XYZ then you'll be able to say like based off of all the times I've practiced and I've tried to be self-aware and I noticed that that one thing went bad I was always able to fix it by doing XYZ and so then you can try to make that your focus for the next pair or bird and it will help eliminate repetitive mistakes um, uh, additionally training tools that you can use to help you objectively evaluate what you're doing is uh, probably the best one I really like um, for, for certain circumstances is the shot cam I think it's a fantastic training tool I've um, uh, they're amazing people at that company and it's a fantastic product and um, I've done multiple videos and podcast interviews uh, with David Stewart and Emily Stewart at Shotcam. you can find them on uh, I think a few of them I think I've done a few I think I did one with the old behind the break I think I did one with shotgun sports I think I did one with um, dead pair podcast and I think I've done a few, I don't think, I know I've done a few with Shotcam themselves um, on their website, on their YouTube channel, uh, and stuff like that, where I go in depth and talk about what you can use the Shotcam for and, and what types of things that you can look for in the videos that you're looking at uh, that, that Shotcam records. And, and what these specific things to look for mean if you see them. Um, so that's a great training tool. Another great training tool is literally just get a little tripod for your phone and put your phone or iPad or something behind you and press record and shoot and then go back and watch the video and see the difference. Um, so great question. Thank you so much for ask, asking that. Um, that was really good. Um, TJ, <laughs> wait, I need to find love. Um, Haas says, an impressive win you had recently was at the US Open at m and &M. Can you elaborate what you did prior to that, abstracted or actual, to apply the concept you talked about b about tonight for planning practice? Um, That's a really good question, Haas, and uh, pure honesty. Sometimes you get lucky and you win shoots that you should not have won. <laughs> and that US Open was one of them where uh, the I didn't practice. I, I, I I didn't at all. I didn't have any, I think maybe the last time I even 
really the last practice I had prior to that may have been like months ago and um, I had just had a incredibly busy work schedule and uh, uh, was going through some pretty crazy uh, stuff in my uh, personal life and uh, some hard stuff and the Monday of, uh, you know, I was basically st trying to start a business uh, uh, outside of shooting and um, the Monday of the tournament, the Monday of the US Open, uh, the business that I was trying to start was unsuccessful and um, left me with a lot of debt and the, uh, the Monday, a lot of debt, <laughs> the Monday of the US Open starting I was uh, I finally uh, paid off all of it and and I had no money in my bank account I couldn't have even driven home um, uh, had I not won money there um, but I was so ecstatic and happy and present and free uh, of any of the financial or business or personal things um, going on in my life that I just purely enjoyed being present in the moment and having that weight lifted off my shoulder and I was hopelessly optimistically positive and um, I started off the first day and uh, I, I told the referee that I was going to shoot on my very first station I was going to shoot this true pair backwards from everybody else and she never heard me I ran the station and she marked me down as uh, lost dead, lost dead, lost dead because she was looking at the wrong pair. I didn't notice it until four stations later. I've, I called Anthony, I was like, I explained the situation. I was like, I know the rules, I know I can't change it, but this is what happened and my whole squad can back me up. Is it possible that we can change it because there's three birds? And I did tell her and she just didn't listen. And he was like, you know the rules. I was like, yeah, I know the rules. So I just kind of ate that. I missed one on that station because I was distracted, ran the course out. The second day, um, I, uh, uh, I, I get visual migraines um, pretty bad uh, a couple times a year. And the second day, um, about halfway through the course, I started to, when you get a, a migraine the way that I get them, I start to see stars and I lose my vision. And halfway through the course, I was straight. I knew I had to shoot a perfect score the second day because I was already three or four targets behind. I think somebody had straighted the course the first day. So the second day, you know, I was like, I gotta straight the course. I was straight with a couple, with halfway through the course, I started to get a migraine. And the only thing you, that I can do to stop that is to it, just ingest an insane amount of caffeine. So I started to try to do that to try to stop it, but it was too late. I ended up losing like 75% of my vision. So like all of my right eye and, and a little bit of my left eye was completely blacked out. I could only see like on the top left corner of my left eye. I shot my last three stations completely blind and 75% of my eyes. Um, and I was basically, I had to shoot from the hip and I had to move my head like this and look over here. And um, I think I missed three targets out of the last four stations or something. Um, and then uh, and then the last day I was like, well, you know, I'm just gonna keep trying to fight for it. And um, I was like 12 birds behind with 67 targets left or nine birds behind or something. And just everybody else shot bad and I shot really well and, and won, won the US Open. <laughs> No, I can't take any credit for any of that. I don't have any idea. Uh, it was just a very lucky moment, and uh, uh, it was a really good uh, moment. If I, you can look at the. This is a very. I'm an honest person, but it's also funny, uh, so I don't mind saying it. You can look at the payout for how much money I won at that shoot, and uh, at that moment in time of my life, that was my net worth. <laughs> so. Um, let's see. I have been sidelined by a back injury and haven't shot in two years. Any tips for a first practice session after a long break? I was just going to shoot uh, around tomorrow and see how I felt. Let me read that again. Uh, I've been sidelined by a back injury and haven't shot in two years. Any tips for a pr first practice session after a long break? 
Garrett, I don't. It's hard for me to give you very very good advice because I don't know the style of shooting that you have or or your background in shooting or your uh, skill level and stuff. Um, but I can tell you that one of the first things to go without us ever realizing if we take some time off of shooting is we lose the ability to remember what it's like to look at the target as hard as we really, really need to. And um, I would say above anything else, uh, don't worry about mechanics right now. Um, go shoot and enjoy it. Um, but uh, just put a lot of conscious effort in in being able to create visual synchronization with the target, seeing it in good detail, and just intuitively shooting for now. Don't get too conscious of your mechanics. Don't worry about it for now. Get the eyes back in sync first, and then after that happens, then start to work on mechanics um, in, in future practice routines because at the end of the day, the visual information that your eyes feed your brain is what drives your body to move the gun. So if we get bad or not as good visual information as possible, you won't be able to do what you're already capable of doing anyway. So tackle that one first and then over time just build in and, and refine your movements and you should be good. And I'm uh, happy to hear that your back is uh, at the level where you can shoot again and we're happy to have you back in the game. Um, Okay, Hoss. <laughs> I think that's where I first met you, Hoss. I, I believe at that shoot. Um, okay, I really wish I could see my computer screen. That would be really helpful right now, but apparently that's not in the cards for me. Um, so I think I will summarize it. I'll, I'll, I'll basically end the episode with a little summary of some things and then a, a reiteration of what I want you to work on and then what the next few episodes will be. But as I am doing that, please feel free to ask any questions that you want me to finish off answering. And if I never got to a question that you asked, let me know. Um, so long story short, in summary, how do you build a practice plan to help you accomplish your goals? You need to use self-awareness and self-assessment to understand what it is that is most negatively influencing your, your ability to put up the score that, that you need to be able to shoot. You can do that by uh, journaling, taking voice memos on your phone after rounds, uh, studying that information, using my shoot analysis sheet uh, to refine the process to make it easier um, anything like that just paying attention to yourself and writing notes you can I mean if you incorporate a coach ask your coach what to do or what your lowest uh, hanging fruit is where your weakest links are basically you need to figure out what you can do to make the most amount of improvement as quickly as possible. Um, the, uh, after you do that, you take the information that you get back from that, that either you deduce by yourself by analyzing your journals and your memos, voice memos, or you take the information that the shoot analysis sheet just automatically generates for you, and you, um, you you look for what it's telling you or what you're deducing to be the the weakest link in your shooting. You take that information and you want to creatively build, for now, you want to creatively build a practice routine or plan or structure. Uh, in the future, you will know, I will teach you how to do it. Um, and in the future, I mean in, in the, at, at the latest in two weeks, um, but for now, I want you to creatively think of a way to, to put together a practice routine or plan or structure so that it, it increases your awareness of the thing that's your weakest link, tests your ability, puts your ability and 
uh, to test and pushes it to its limits so that you're trying to whatever variable it is or thing it is that you're trying to get better at you're doing it at, at a level to which is not so easy for you that every time you try to do it it's perfect uh, you want to do it at a difficulty level that has that honestly has a, a, a higher probability of an inability to do it correctly as opposed to the other way around um, because you want it to be a challenging process for, that forces you to be very cognitively and consciously involved in focusing on that specific thing as you're doing it so that way the only way that you feel like you can do it perfectly is if you get that level of detailed focus and, and concentrated focus on that thing um, so you want to you want to create a practice routine that hits all of those things then when you go out to practice you want to follow that routine but you want to follow it with a massive emphasis on placing the value of what you're doing on that specific variable and the success of that specific variable not the result of the shot um, because if you place it on the result of the shot then you will you will uh, teach your brain that the good uh, if you care about breaking the bird more than you care about doing the correct mechanic you're trying to learn then you will number one be completely on autopilot when you're shooting and not even be able to be aware of the new thing that you're trying to do which means that you won't actually even do it because as you're uh, as you're focusing on trying to hit the bird you can't also segmented uh, you can't also segment your conscious focus on trying to do the thing you're trying to learn and so therefore you will just be shooting exactly the way that you already are so you're not doing anything uh, other than some uh, other than um, you know uh, putting more emphasis on not changing uh, the thing you're trying to get better in on top of that uh, you want to do it that way you want to put your conscious focus in the thing you're trying to do and not the result of the shot because that allows you to have the, the level of self-awareness required to be able to um, to uh, uh, compare and contrast shot to shot to shot off of what you feel like theoretically should be the perfect example of that specific thing so that you can as you shoot and you continue to progress through this practice you can make the analysis of okay that shot felt like this XYZ specific thing was not as good as I could have done it and that affected my ability to do what I'm trying to do so let me put more focus on this next shot uh, or dur in during this next shot let me focus harder on trying to make that variable that just went wrong be better and then you try to focus and you, you basically you're like playing a game of um, uh, you're like chasing the, the missing link from shot to shot to shot and trying to make every shot better and as you go through that process you will make big loops of you know in your in in trying to do this one specific thing better the next uh, you know uh, something that you already have done well won't be as good so then you'll try to make on your next shot that other variable that went bad on your previous shot better and that will make some other thing worse and so you'll just go on these these feedback loops of of making mistakes and chasing perfection in each one of those things but it's the process of doing that that makes you learn and get better at the thing that you're trying to, to build up after that after you do that practice um, then I will say you can add in there a little bit of stuff where you are focused on um, on result uh, or the product of the shot um, and go do it on uh, on something that you feel confident in being able to shoot if you feel like that's important to your self image because that practice that you just shot made you miss a lot if you want to finish on a lot of breaks to feel better that's totally fine um, uh, but don't forget what you learned and experienced uh, previously in that practice 
then after that practice go back and in some way or another if you're somebody that I don't even want to qualify it as that in some way or another you should record what you learned whether that be a three minute voice memo about just what it felt like to be in the specific physical emotional or mental state um, or, or visual state that you needed to be able to do the thing that you were trying to do perfectly talk about what it felt like to be in that state so that way the next time you try to access it that you'll you'll have a better understanding and a better grasp of what it feels like to be there that way you don't end up thinking that you have it but you don't really or maybe you whatever it is summarize the thing that you learned in a in a voice memo in a video to yourself in notes on your phone in refilling out a new self analysis sheet whatever it is don't don't lose the progress that you made um, and then uh, and then we'll go from there that's about all I want to give you for now because uh, I want you to go do that yourself. I want you to come up with an idea yourself and be creative and be experimental and break down the variables of the things that are involved in, in whatever specific thing that you're trying to practice and make better and just keep uh, unpacking it. Break it apart in the smaller and smaller and smaller variables and then practice those small variables. Because at the end of the day, it's our ability to combine our skill level and all those things into one thing that allows us to get better at what we're doing holistically. Um, so off the top of my head, I think I summarized it pretty good. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to the comments and see um, if there's any questions I have to ask again. Brandon, yes, that's that's a very intuitive of you. Um, you. You said that was an interesting answer. Sounds like the approach is to set specific goals for different categories of technical, mental, procedural, visual aspects of the game. Hundred percent. That's exactly what we want to do. Um, uh, that I mean, basically, that's you're you're more efficiently saying what I said, which is that you know we want to to unpack and and expand all the little things that are involved in every little every move you're trying to learn or every visual mechanic you're trying to learn or every state of awareness that you're trying to gain knowledge in unpack it focus on the little thing and um, you know there's so many examples of this in in sports all across the board where the, the best athletes in the world, you know, they don't go and practice, you know, Tiger Woods doesn't go and practice just a round of 18 to get better. He breaks the game down to its essential and, and boiled down minimalistic parts and then, and then drills those to perfection and then puts it back together in a, in a way that allows him to um, you know uh, that sentence was going nowhere but he puts it back together and then his game is more refined but it's the important part of this is that if you do it this way you're not just gaining the knowledge that you're specifically trying to to build or the skill that you're trying to improve you're also gaining an understanding a conceptual understanding of the game that uh, breaks it down in a way to where your understanding of what is required to do certain things and your understanding of your abilities and capabilities and limitations is so high because not very many people approach practicing like this so the byproducts of practicing like this are equally valuable um, as the main purpose of doing it um, and those things happen without having to try to focus on them
uh, Curtis. Yeah, what were we talking about? Four hundred words, or four thousand words max. I'm out, man. That's all I got for you guys. Um, unless you have any more questions, I think we'll probably call it. It's already on, it's already eleven thirty over here. Uh, you guys all stayed on for so long. I was not expecting that call to be or this uh, uh, episode to be this long. Um, uh, but man, thank you guys. That was very very cool. I'm not quite sure how to end this video call because I can't see my computer screen. <laughs> what the heck, man? Technology hates me. People don't believe me, but I'm telling you, my phones just just die. My computer screens die. The internet dies. My, I mean, goodness, it's insane. <laughs> this is it's actually pretty funny. Um. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you all. Um. I will. Uh, this is pretty late. I don't. And also, I don't know what the computer. Um. If I can't figure out a way to turn my computer back or get my screen back on, then I I'm. I'm kind of at a loss. Uh, because I'm. This is going to be a recorded episode as well. Like it's going to be released as audio only. But that would require me to download the audio uh, video from YouTube, separate the audio, because um, I was not recording audio direct while I did this. Um, I should have, but uh, I didn't because I'm being on the hotel Wi-Fi and stuff. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to over uh, over dedicate too much processing power on the laptop to running all these things so um, and I was also afraid of battery usage uh, but I'll see I'll try to get this uh, episode released as a recorded episode audio only um, by tomorrow if not it'll be out when it's out you'll all it, immediately this will be available for people on YouTube so if you want to go back and listen again we can do that um, that sounds good doesn't look like anybody has any questions cool thank you guys um you're gonna have to leave because i can't end the call <laughs> or i can't end the video i don't think i'm afraid to press the power button on here uh because i don't know what's gonna happen so i will uh sayonara all of you Nate, you still want to, you're having nightmares on this target. Oh, man. I don't know why I just drinking Red Bull. It's 11.30 at night. That was uh, impulsive. Oh, you know what I might be able to do? I know what I can do. Oh, computer screen's back on. Yes, there we go. Don't know what happened. All right, cool. Now I can actually end the stream. So I'm going to end this. And um, cool. Good night, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it so much. Again, I ask you one thing. If you know somebody that this can help, I, I just ask that you tell them about the podcast because I don't want to I don't want to blow it up in marketing and advertisement because I, I would rather have people in here that are personally just really excited about being part of this community thing rather than people that are going to be in and out because eventually you know the audience is going to grow to you know the same size anyway and I would rather it be uh you know I would rather it be people uh that are that are able to participate and follow along and do the things that we uh, want to do so that's all I ask if you know somebody tell them I don't even honestly I don't uh, yeah and um, and then if you feel free to send in questions emails um, do the shoot analysis sheet if you haven't done your goal submission yet uh, fill that out um, and if you have any tournaments coming up best of luck and uh, We'll see you next time. See you guys. Adios.